Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 2624 in the name of Mark MacDonald on adoption and permanence in Scotland. Can I invite any members who are interested to, in speaking in, to press the request to speak buttons now? And if members are ready, I will call on Mark MacDonald to speak to and to move the motion. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, every child deserves the best possible start in life and to grow up feeling and being loved, wanted, safe and secure. Uh, all across Scotland, there are thousands of adoptive families providing the love and security that all children deserve. They make a huge difference to the lives of children whose early lives have often been blighted by abuse and neglect. And I want to thank them all for making that difference for their children. Achieving permanence for children through adoption necessarily involves a process of checks and balances in a system which applies a rigorous approach involving a range of agencies and professionals. That system needs to be proportionate and effective and enable the finding of permanent homes for children. In recent years, we have made much progress in improving the system and the process. The starting point is the 2007 Adoption and Children Act. Its measures have resulted in changes which have been an unalloyed good, and I want to pay tribute to Labour's Hugh Henry, then Minister for Children and Young People, and the Liberal Democrats Robert Brown, the Deputy Minister, for shepherding that legislation through this Parliament. As Robert Brown said in closing the debate at Stage 3, the legislation represented not just a milestone but also a start and that is what has been achieved. Services have been improved and now function within a more coherent framework. The development and use of permanence orders has helped to provide adoptive parents and adopted children with greater security. More and better support, not just in financial terms, but also by way of advice, information and training is now available. And crucially, it enabled opportunities for more people to adopt, including same-sex couples. But implementing the legislation and the change required has not always been as straightforward as we might have hoped. None of us foresaw nor wished for the demise of the British, Adop uh, British Association for Adoption and Fostering, or BAF, uh, in July 2015. In order to carry on its work providing advice, training and support to professionals and organisations, the Scottish Government stepped in with funding to enable the creation of Adoption and Fostering Alliance Scotland, or AFA Scotland, and to enable some of the former BAF Scotland employees and members to continue their work. We now provide £100,000 of funding to AFA Scotland and Government supports a range of other charities and organisations doing vital work in this area, including St Andrew's Children's Society, established over 90 years ago. Uh, the Society receives over £160,000 a year to maintain and expand Scotland's adoption register, as well as seeking to recruit more adopters and foster carers. Birthlink provides and maintains the Adoption Contact Register for Scotland. Its work is especially important in enabling the reconnection of those who have been adopted with their birth families through its register containing tens of thousands of people's details. And Adoption UK receives £75,500 to promote adoption policy and good practice and to operate the National Adoption Advice Line. Adoption UK has also taken on facilitating the first Adoption Week Scotland, which is taking place this week, and rightly it is themed as a celebration of adoption in Scotland. Across Scotland, events are taking place, including an information session for people interested in finding out more about adoption and a practitioner's networking event for those working in the sector to meet and hear input about initiatives regarding adoption and permanence, and also a large celebratory event for adoptive families being held at a soft play centre in Edinburgh. I hope members would use the opportunity of this week to promote these events and also highlight the role played in their communities by adoptive families. This week we should be doing all that we can to celebrate adoption. With the Children and Young People Act 2014, uh, we have placed Scotland's adoption register on a statutory footing. The register provides opportunities for children to match with families across Scotland if they cannot be matched locally. By requiring all local authorities to use the register, it is playing an important role in reducing delays in children being matched with adoptive families and finding permanent homes. Since its establishment in 2011, the register has facilitated 320 matches with adoptive families. I recently visited the 300th register match and was impressed with the supportive and caring environment in which the child was now developing in, thanks to his new family. But the progress enabled by the register is not by itself enough. The current rate of matches is good, but it is not good enough. There are still far too many children waiting, growing up while waiting, for a family and a home. And there are not enough prospective adopters to provide those children with a home. 
If we are to see the step change in children finding permanent and nurturing homes, we need to see adoption numbers grow over the coming years in the hundreds. But we can only get there if we start by reaching out through our collective efforts to the dozens of potential adopters willing and able to help out the hardest to place children and young people. So we need to ensure the system continues to evolve to increase opportunities. The Register is playing a big part in this, exploring and developing, developing innovative and child-centred ways of promoting adoption. One such example is Adoption Exchange Days, which feature profiles of children waiting for adoption, including photographs, drawings and letters, which help approved adopters to gain an insight into those children. Exchange Days began in 2012 and have been held throughout Scotland, resulting in 88 matches to date. Another example is Adoption Activity Days, where prospective adopters can meet a range of children waiting to be adopted and to engage with them in a supported, safe and fun environment. So far, there have been three adoption activity days held in Scotland, with positive feedback from those who have attended, including through an independent evaluation carried out on the first activity day, which has been published and is available from the Parliament Library. The first activity day was held in October 2015 in Prestwick, with seven matches being made as a result. The second in May 2016 in Perth resulted in two children being matched. The third was recently held in Bathgate on the 5th of November, and so far there have been 14 notes of interest in pursuing adoption further. The 300th matched family I visited came about with the help of an activity day. The adoptive parents said that without attending the event, there is a strong possibility they would not have made such a connection and been matched with their son. Presiding officer, having held three such successful events, I can today announce that from April 2017, adoption activity days will become a permanent feature of Scotland's adoption register. Moreover, I am increasing funding to the register to double the number of events from three to six per year. While we are working to embed an approach that puts children at its heart, we also need to use technology to maximise resources and ensure prospective adoptive parents can play an active and proactive role. I can therefore also announce, Presiding Officer, that we are putting into effect measures which enable adopter-led matching through a secure online system called LinkMaker as part of Scotland's adoption register. This allows prospective adopters to look for matches directly, while also enabling social workers, practitioners and agencies to seek placements for children by considering the profiles of prospective adopters. While many registered adoption agencies throughout the UK are now using LinkMaker effectively and securely, adding it to our adoption register will provide consistent access across Scotland. Of course, making the process more child and parent centred and more efficient will not by itself improve adoption rates. One of the biggest challenges is to reduce the drift and delay that still often permeates parts of the process. Our work to address this is centred on the Permanence and Care Excellence Programme, or PACE, which supports improvement projects in 10 local authority areas, with plans to add a further four by March 2017. We funded the Centre of Excellence for Looked After Children, Celsus, since January 2014 to implement PACE. Its care and permanence team works closely with individual local authorities and their partners to make improvements to their decision-making systems. By providing intensive system-wide support, the Celsus team and the local authorities they work with put early intervention into action, streamlining decision-making processes, creating concurrent planning by all the agencies involved in an adoption process. And while local areas are identifying and taking forward the actions right for their locale, which will lead to improvements, we are monitoring and evaluating their impact with a view to sharing what works more widely. And I have recently had the opportunity to see firsthand uh, some of the uh, outcomes that have been achieved in relation to PACE projects in place in a number of local authorities across Scotland. I think that the work is very encouraging. Uh, and moreover, it's an example, I think, of where practitioners uh, have been and feel empowered to take the best course of action in order to deliver the best outcomes for the children in their local authority area. So the PACE projects across Scotland uh, give us a route map for the future. If we can ensure that all parts of the system are involved and committed to improvement, that professionals and practitioners have the tools, skills and knowledge they need to effect change, that we continue to adapt those tools to meet needs and interests, and that crucially we increasingly involve prospective adoptive parents, involve prospective adoptive parents and children in the process, we will continue to achieve more adoptions and more permanence for children. Uh, Presiding officer, I want to conclude where I began by thanking those working and volunteering in the adoption system for the commitment they bring to this vital work and thanking all those adoptive parents and the ones still to come 
uh, for giving some of Scotland's most vulnerable children a home, a family, security, care and, crucially, love and hope. Um, while we are grateful to all of those who currently adopt children and those who are registered as prospective adopters, I recognise that we have more to do to encourage more people to come forward as prospective adopters. So part of today's debate is about celebrating the work that is ongoing currently to provide those safe, stable home environments for children in need of permanence. Part of it also is, I think, to serve as a rallying call to others who may be considering adoption to look at the benefits that it can bring, not just to the children who are then uh, adopted and achieve permanence, but also to the prospective adopters and the benefits that can be brought to them as a result of becoming adopt an adoptive family. I, I can confirm uh, that we will be accepting the amendment from the Labour Party today, uh, although I would make just a couple of notes. The one is that um, we do not operate a priority system based uh, on background or status. Uh, children should be given support based on need. However, I believe the spirit of the amendment is about ensuring that adopted children uh, get whatever support they need and are not forgotten about at the point at which they leave the care system. So in that spirit, I think we can accept the Labour amendment today. Um, I think that this has the potential to be a very consensual uh, debate and I'm uh, glad that we were able to accept the amendment in that respect. So there is more to be done to ensure that more children and young people benefit from a secure, permanent and nurturing family environment at the earliest opportunity. Uh, and as we pause this week to celebrate adoption and the difference it makes, let's resolve to get on and make sure we continue to do just that. Oh, and I move the motion in my name. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Minister. And I now call on Monica Lennon to speak to and move Amendment 2624.1. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate today and the motion in Mark Macdonald's name regarding the issue of adoption and permanent solutions for looked after children in Scotland. Scotland's first ever National Adoption Week, which takes place this week, is certainly a cause to celebrate. This is a great opportunity for people who are interested in adoption to find out more about the process, perhaps to engage with and speak to those who have already adopted about their experiences, and also for organisations involved in the adoption process to encourage and raise awareness about adoption. I hope that professionals and those interested in adoption will be able to make the most out of this week and that it will be a success that can be repeated in the future. I am pleased that we have been able to allocate this time in the Chamber to celebrate National Adoption Week and to engage in broader discussion about the situation of adoption and long-term care solutions for children in Scotland. For children who are unable to live with their birth parents, we know that adoption and other long-term care solutions lead to the best possible outcomes for that child's development. The statistical evidence and real-life stories, which I'm sure many of us are aware of, tell us that adoption can be hugely transformative for the lives of children and their families. The acknowledgement from the Minister regarding the success of existing measures on adoption over the past decade, including the Adoption and Children Scotland Act 2007 and the introduction of the Scotland Adoption Register is welcome. We have made a lot of progress over the last few years in encouraging adoption by making it more accessible to all potential adoptive parents and providing better access to the support they need to go through the adoption process and making it easier for authorities to place children with prospective adoptive families. Despite this welcome progress, we also know that there is much work still to do to improve the situation of Scotland's looked after and adopted children. The government's acknowledgement that we must consider doing more to speed up decision making and reduce drift and delay in the system is very welcome. And on that basis uh, of that commitment on these benches, Scottish Labour members will be supporting the Scottish Government's motion. And I'm very grateful that our um, amendment has been accepted in the spirit it was intended. When a child can no longer live with their birth parents, it's of course right that authorities exhaust every possible avenue to reunite that child with their family before deciding to put the child forward for adoption. But we also must make sure that the rights and needs of the children are always at the centre of decision making. And we would welcome moves to expand the use of the parallel process model, which is used in Glasgow, to explore, to explore more than one option for a child at the same time to reduce delay in the system. When speaking recently to foster and adoptive parents, 
One parent told me the story of a newborn baby that had been placed in their care at just a few days old and was only eventually moved on at the age of three and a half. This type of delay in permanent planning for a child is unacceptable and wherever possible should be prevented from occurring for the sake of the well-being and development of the child. <coughs> Certainty and stability is the gold standard and I welcome the reference in the motion regarding the rollout of the Permanence and Care Excellence Programme to all local authority areas to ensure that children benefit from a secure environment at the earliest opportunity. Supporting permanent long-term solutions for children's care wherever possible has the best possible results for the child's long-term well-being and development. However, the evidence and stories from authorities and professionals involved in the care of looked after children, as well as experiences of adoptive families, tell us also that adoption is not a magical fix. Adoptive families are an incredible asset to Scotland's looked after children and our society as a whole but they can also continue to face challenges after a child's adoption. National Adoption Week should be the opportunity for us to give voice to these challenges and to show support for Scotland's adoptive families and the continuing challenges which they can face. The reality of adoption in Scotland is not, we know, the mythical and old-fashioned image of an unwanted newborn baby being taken in and supposedly rescued by a usually affluent couple. Most children are adopted from care and adoptive families in Scotland are parenting some of Scotland's most vulnerable children, a significant proportion of whom are suffering from the long-term effects of developmental trauma caused by neglect or abuse. Research from Adoption UK shows that one in four adoptive families are at risk of breaking down because of the lack of available support. This has led organisations like Scottish Adoption and Adoption UK to back the campaign A Fair Deal for Adoptive Families in Scotland, which calls for the expansion of support to every adoptive family who needs it and priority support to be given to adopted children who need additional support in school and in child and adolescent mental health services. So I hope the Minister and colleagues right across the Chamber will today support the amendment in my name, which deals with some of these issues and acknowledges the needs for the changes to be made in relation to the support available to adopted children and their families. A child with developmental trauma who is adopted on a Friday does not suddenly no longer require the support they were receiving as a looked after child come the Monday. And yet in many cases, adoptive families describe hitting a wall when it comes to access accessing support and occasions when services and authorities are understanding for the first few months or year after adoption and then that understanding slowly slips away. Just this week I was made aware of a case of a single adoptive parent who lives in, in Bells Hill in Lanarkshire in the region I represent who was matched for adoption with a child with a diagnosed learning disability and developmental difficulties. This child was termed as hard to place because of their needs and the adopter had to secure an adoption allowance from the placing local authority. A circumstances meant that she would need to give up work to meet the needs of her child during the first few years of placement. Once the child was placed with her, they began to meet developmental stages that had previously thought to be beyond their abilities, making it clear that their experience of early neglect had been partly to blame for their delay. With the support of adoption allowance enabling the parent to meet the child's needs, the outcomes met were life-changing for them. The parent is now meeting the challenge of getting the right support in place for their child in their school placement. They have been thriving at nursery in the environment there. And she is keen that the transition to primary school doesn't cause any regression in her child's development. Ensuring the right support in schools is in place for adopted children is vitally important. And I therefore welcome moves from the adoption organisations like Adoption UK to work with the Association of Head Teachers and Deputies in Scotland to make all schools attachment aware. Adoptive families can often find education to be one of the biggest challenges, with the worst case scenarios resulting in turning to home education as the best solution for their child due to not having the child's needs met by their teachers. The, the attachment aware campaign is a welcome action and I hope it is something which more schools and local authorities can get behind. 
There are, of course, many examples of good practice across Scotland when it comes to support for adoptive families. For instance, schools in East Lothian are currently taking part in a project through the Education Attainment Fund, which focuses on improving the relationship between teachers and children who might have attachment issues, particularly those who are adopted. The project aims at improving communication using one personal folder to ensure that information isn't lost in changes between teachers and support staff and aims to introduce attachment ambassadors to each school who can act as a single point of contact and support to families who require it. We can learn so much from these models of good practice and should be striving to ensure this type of access to support is comprehensively available across the country, not just in patchy areas. The vital role of local authorities in caring for looked after children and placing children with adoptive families cannot be underestimated. They need to be properly resourced to carry out this role and it's important we use all the available powers of this parliament to ensure that social work departments and local authorities right across the country have the resources they need to look after Scotland's children. Because looked after children are Scotland's children it's all of our responsibility to ensure the best life chances for children in care and ensuring that our system of placing children with permanent adoptive families is robust and supportive is part of that responsibility. Adoptive children and their families should be able to receive the support that they need to, to thrive and I hope colleagues across the chamber, presiding officer, will be able to support that sentiment today. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. And I call on Jeremy Balfour to open for the Conservatives. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I welcome the uh, motion in the name of the Minister and the amendment um, by the Labour and the Conservatives will be supporting uh, both of them today. As we've heard today, this week is Adoption UK, our sponsor on Adoption Week. And we welcome and support its aims of this week going forward. There are 14,440 looked after children in Scotland today. Last year, 500 children were adopted. So clearly the gap still between those who are looking perhaps for adoption and those that are being adopted is still large. And we have still a long way to go in Scotland to reach and help the most vulnerable. However, we recognise that this government and previous governments have tried to do this, and we welcome the moves that have happened in the past and look forward to new initiatives coming forward in the future. We need to encourage a diversity of those who are looking to adopt different types of backgrounds, different types of couples, different types of individuals who will be willing to put themselves for adoption. We need to get rid of some of the myths about what you have to be or who you have to be or what type of person you require to be to go ahead and adopt. And I hope this week from what is going out in the media, what is happening within this chamber, we will see a positive message that yes, adoption can be hard, but it is fulfilling and helpful and something we want to encourage families and individuals to think about. Yeah. Uh, I welcome what is happening in regard to Scotland's adoption register and I pay credit to the government for that. I pay credit that the system is now online, that local authorities can uh, log into it and it's given a much more flexible system. I think adoption days are proving very accessible where prospective parents can go and meet with social workers and, and find out at least the bare bones about children looking to be adopted. But then I think there is an issue at that point. It was interesting, I was talking to a constituent here in Edinburgh who went along just a few months ago, well, a, a while ago now, to one of these days. Uh, they were matched with a child out of that but we are still awaiting to adopt because the process is taking so long. And I think we have moved a long way in regard to the legal process, but it is still complicated, consuming, 
and often takes for matching and approval to adoption a very long period of time. And I would welcome a, a government to look at whether we can speed up that legislation and whether we can do things to help um, both the birth family and also the adopting family to get the process. Yes, sir. Mark MacDonald. I'm grateful to Jeremy Balfour for highlighting the, the point. Obviously, I can't comment on the individual case in the chamber that he cites, but if he wishes to write to me with the details, if he hasn't already done so, I'll be more than happy to look into that and see what the issues are uh, and whether it's something that applies particularly to that case or whether it's something within the system that we perhaps need to give some consideration to. Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, Minister, for that. I, I just think we just need to look at uh, sometimes meetings are arranged by social work and they don't fit in to the family or they're cancelled at short notice. Yes, we need to look at the best interests of the child and we need to keep the process moving forward. But we also have to remember how hard it is for the birth mother, the birth family, sometimes to give up their children. And perhaps we also need to look at what support we need to give them as they go through that process as well. Once the adoption process has happened, there are many issues that uh, families will face. We know roughly a third of adoption cases will go very smoothly and well. A third will be rocky, but they will, be, they will come through that. And a third, unfortunately, will often end up uh, with further issues and difficult issues in those. Clearly, the issue, as has been highlighted already, in regard to attachment is important. Children, young children, often face attachment issues, whether adopted or not. Having stood outside a playground at a P1 for the last four months, you can see that. But often adopted children do have greater attachment issues. And I think we need to encourage, as has already been said, head teachers, local authorities, to put in the appropriate resources so that teachers can be aware of these issues and how to deal with these issues. We need to look at secondary schools, at how teenagers start to become more aware of themselves, start to ask questions. Again, that happens with any teenager. But a teenager that has been adopted will have questions about where have I come from? What was my birth mother like? Where do I belong? Will I turn out like my birth parents? These are good questions and fair questions, and we need to make sure that the appropriate support is given to children as they go through that. We also have to acknowledge that adoption can lead to educational issues as well. Yes, we're making progress, but 14% of looked after school leavers still receive no qualifications in our schools. That figure is simply too high. We need to work to make sure that those that come through the system that have been adopted are given the education that meets their needs and the support that they require. We are talking about the most vulnerable in our society. But the good news is that adoption does work, that children do help. Let me quote um, a quote from uh, Adoption UK, when uh, a lady or in her older years wrote back and says, what people seem to not understand is that the family doesn't have to be blood. Loyalty, faith, kindness are what makes a family. And that is why we can make this true in thousands of life. Throughout my life, I have learned this very important lesson, that love is the most precious thing in the world to me. That is what we want to say to every child within our society today, that love is the most important thing. And we need to do that by supporting the parents who go forward with the adoption process. We need to do that by supporting uh, the, the families that put themselves Forward. And we have to make sure that local authorities, schools, social work, national legislation is all working towards that. 
and I'm happy to support the motion in the name of the government. We now move to the open speeches. Uh, I do have some time in hand, so time can be given for interventions. So around six minutes, please. Jenny Goruth, followed by Liz Smith. Thank you, presiding officer. Uh, I have friends who were adopted, and I have friends who have adopted children themselves. It is one of the most selfless acts that any human being can commit to do. Taking on the legal responsibility as a parent, providing a child with a loving home and a secure environment in which to grow up. I note Labour's amendment today in the name of Monica Lennon, in particular the cognizance given to the provision of mental health uh, services for adopted children via their education. I'm sure that members will already be tired and hear of my teacher rhetoric, but nonetheless, it is worth emphasising today again the centrality of health and wellbeing to Curriculum for Excellence as one of the eight core curriculum uh, areas, in addition to the overall importance it has as underpinned by the Getting It Right for Every Child framework. I know that Monica Lennon has been a passionate advocate um, for how we work to improve and support mental health education. Indeed, I welcomed her contribution during my members' debate on the topic in September. Children who have been adopted often experience trauma, and therefore a recognition that their mental health needs be met in parity with their peers is certainly welcome from these benches. As the Minister stated in his opening speech, the Scottish Government set up the Scotland's uh, Adoption Register in 2011, and today over 300 families nationally uh, have children have been matched through Scotland's Adoption Register. And going forward, it is imperative that the Government work to deliver permanence more quickly for looked after children and young people. I am delighted to hear the Minister today commit to do exactly that. Permanence, however, is not just about adoption. It can include a supported return to a child's birth parents, where that is the most appropriate way to support them. But for vulnerable children, permanence is of vital importance. These are the children who are often marginalised before they even reach the school gates, who live in chaotic households, who may never have known love. These are the children whose schools traditionally sent home because they didn't have a tie on, who teachers like me told off for not bringing a pencil to school. These are the children that far too often the system, whether that be care or education, failed. In 2014-15, almost three quarters of looked after school leavers were aged 16 and over, compared to over a quarter of school leavers generally. 35% of looked after children leave school with one or more qualification SCQF level 5, compared to 85% of all pupils generally. And the rate of exclusions among looked after children is also much higher than in the general school population, although it should be said that the figure is improving generally. Nonetheless, the figures show us that uh, being able to achieve early permanence is a significant indicator when it comes to attainment and achievement. Permanence can include remaining at home uh, through a permanence order, a kinship care order or via adoption, adoption itself. And the legal certainty which permanence brings often cements a home which loves and cares for the child in question. Last December, the Government announced a strengthening of the partnership with CELSIS, or the Centre for Excellence for Looked After Children, uh, to offer the Permanent and Care Excellence Programme. And in March of this year, the Government committed to fund CELSIS with over £580,000 a year to support the improvements for helping looked after children find a permanent home. And this has now allowed for a further six new advisors to be appointed to work on PACE and to provide support to local authorities. Today's motion supports the rollout of the PACE programme so that more children benefit from a secure, permanent and nurturing family environment at the earliest opportunity. Fife is the third biggest population of looked after children of any local authority in Scotland. I met with Celsus last month and I know that they are already proactively engaged across the authority to support improvement and partnership working with the Scottish Government. The Government published its Looked After Children and Young People strategy in November last year, which builds on existing improvements and calls on the sector to commit to improvement. The strategy priorities include support for families early to prevent children from becoming looked after through early engagement, help for children to have a safe, secure, nurturing and permanent home through early permanence, and making sure that every child receives the best care and support through improving the quality of their care. It should also be said that the picture is not one of doom and gloom for Scotland's looked after children. Rather, it is one of improvement. The proportion of looked after children with at least one qualification at SCQF level 5 has increased from 15% to 35%. And the proportion of looked after children in positive destination has also increased from 40% in 2009 to 69% last year. Presiding officer, in closing, I would like to encourage members to read the blog by Fiona Aitken on the Celsius website, which looks to dispel some of the myths around adoption. It's not all about babies. 
The people I know who have adopted did not so, do so with young infants. They nonetheless gave the children that they adopted the love, support and the nurture which those children would not or could not have received from their biological parents. No adoption journey is the same, but for everyone involved, adoption is ultimately about family, compassion, hope, happiness and acceptance. Today's motion reflects the importance of all of these vital aspects in the adoption process. Thank you. Liz Smith to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think this has been a, a very good debate, and it's very good that it's taking place in, in a very special week. Um, the four preceding speeches have all been excellent and very considered, and I think that's uh, uh, just a measure of how important this debate actually is. And the Minister uh, mentioned in his opening remarks about two previous Ministers, Hugh Henry and Robert Brown, and I think we do owe uh, a lot uh, to them, but it's reminded me just uh, how long this issue has actually taxed uh, particularly the Education uh, Committee of this Parliament. Now, today's uh, motion and amendment make clear the nature of a very consensual approach, rightly so, um, but as the Minister said, that should not encourage any complacency because it remains abundantly clear that a child's life chances are largely dictated by the early years of his or her life, and as such, it is just so crucial that we establish that permanency and consistency that has been spoken about uh, in the previous speeches. Uh, throughout the study uh, of the previous Education Committee, the statistics could hardly be more blunt. Looked after children have the odds stacked against them from the start with poorer academic attainment and less chance of progressing towards a positive de destination in education and work. It was a deep-rooted problem that the Education Committee uh, looked at, uh, which as yet has not been fully tackled. And I think all of us in this chamber uh, have a duty to ensure that changes are forthcoming uh, because it simply isn't good enough that more than one in ten young people living, uh, leaving care in Scotland experience some form of homelessness within two years. Jeremy Balfour has made very clear uh, that we do acknowledge and compliment the Scottish Government uh, on the progress that has been made, but obviously that we welcome further moves from the Scottish Government to speed up the adoption process and allow more placements for the, exactly the reason uh, that Jeremy Balfour has laid out. The 2011 report by the Scottish uh, Children's Reporter Administration showed that it takes on average two years to secure an adoption from the first involvement uh, with state services. And in some extreme cases, it can take up to 10 years. And the Minister's right to say that there has been uh, good progress, but I think uh, as his intervention uh, on Jeremy Balfour indicated, um, th that there are issues which perhaps with specific cases could provide um, uh, some learning experiences for the Scottish, or for, not just for the Scottish Government, but for all of us as to how we uh, go forward. Because it's important that that adoption process should become as simple uh, as is possible, with, obviously within the uh, limits of checking and assessing and the compatibility of uh, children with the parents, and perhaps a measure that can be learned from some other governments uh, in this respect. In order uh, to achieve that permanence in adoption placements, we do require a sufficient stock of adopters across Scotland uh, on the adoption register. And currently, 800 foster families are required to fulfil the pre pressures on that system. And I noted uh, what Robin Duncan, manager of Scotland's adoption register, uh, pointed out uh, in terms of the work that has to be done there in order to ensure that we have enough adoptive families in Scotland uh, for all the children who need placements. And he also noted that we are particularly struggling sometimes to find families for children who are, uh, as Jenny Gilruth has rightly said, just that little bit uh, older and perhaps have more complicated needs and perhaps some greater learning difficulties. Now, many adoption agencies are carrying out recruitment campaigns to attract new adopters and they should rightly be uh, warmly congratulated uh, on the efforts that they have uh, taken to raise the profile of adoption. And I hope that this week and indeed this debate uh, can further that process. We believe that that work can be helped perhaps by the creation of an adoption czar that can be a, a voluntary post supported by uh, small logistics and campaign and office budget appointed by Scottish ministers and tasked with coordinating and encouraging efforts to raise the profile of adoption in Scotland. So we look forward uh, to moves in that direction. Permanence is so vital for looked after children. Since 2010, more children have been in placements that lasted over five years, and that's very welcome. However, for shorter term placements, the length of care times have remained more or less the same. 22% of adoption placements were less than six months in duration, which can have obviously a significant impact on the emotional and intellectual development of children, particularly when it comes to narrowing the attainment gap. We all know that when we try to narrow that gap, 
It is clear that looked after children are underperforming academically and, as I say, the previous education committee in this parliament spent a very great deal of time under the stewardship uh, of the previous chairman to look at exactly why this is and what it is that we have to drill down uh, onto. And I think Stuart Maxwell and the committee of that time had some good suggestions to make. Although these figures uh, are showing some signs of improvement, I think they do remain significantly worse uh, than the average when it comes to all school leavers. And that's obviously a, an issue of very considerable concern as youngsters want to move on to college or university or into the world of work. And I would urge the minister perhaps to concentrate some effort uh, on looking at what we have to do to help that process, because I think it's, uh, it would be a, a very difficult situation if we allowed youngsters to go out into the world without perhaps the support that they have, even after they've come through perhaps a difficult time in, in their life. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, can I uh, finish my own remarks on saying that I think this uh, debate is hugely significant. It has been a long time in this Parliament where it's been uh, a focus, but I think we do welcome every effort that's being made by the Scottish Government just now to hasten the process of the progress that we all know and we all want to achieve uh, when it comes to supporting our youngsters and ensuring that they have really the best start in life, but also the crucial aspect of a supportive family around them and the trust that that engenders about the way that they can see their future. So we are very happy both to support the motion and the amendment. I have Fulton McGregor to be followed by Ian Gray. Thank you, President Officer. It gives me great pleasure to be able to speak in this debate. This is an area that I have some experience in and I hope to use that to contribute to a positive cross-chamber discussion. Although I have to say that based on what I've heard so far, uh, I think that the, the contributions have been excellent and much of what I'll be saying will be echoing what other speakers have said. I'll also be following uh, on, in the footsteps of uh, Jenny Gilruth and continue to talk about my experience before becoming an MSP. Um, we are told that eventually you do forget, but we'll see. <laughs> I spent eight years working with ch children and young people as a social worker, much of this in the front line of child protection. Often I had to manage situations where children had to be looked after away from home, usually with family members and other times with temporary foster carers. And trust me when I say there are very few things more emotionally challenging than when assessing if a child should remain at home or not. Many times children who are removed are able to return to their parents quickly, and this is of course what everyone wants. However, other times the concerns and dangers are too great for this to happen, and many children remain looked after and accommodated. And this means that their care and support, as others have said, is reviewed regularly by the local authority. It has been well documented in this discussion and in others that the outcomes for children who are looked after and accommodated are not always what we would want. Looked after children can often fare worse in terms of a number of outcomes, including education, health and involvement in the criminal justice system. And that is why I think that everyone in this chamber will fully welcome the First Minister's recent announcement of a root and branch review of the care system to deliver better outcomes for those that we are looking after as a nation. One of the ways that outcomes can be improved is through deciding on permanency at an earlier stage, which of course includes adoption as well as permanence orders which were introduced in the 2007 Act. Research has clearly demonstrated that when sound, informed and speedy decisions are made about where a child should live, the, the child is more likely to be settled, happy and their outcomes and life chances are improved. And that is why I would agree with Monica Lennon's um, amendment, the part of the amendment where she describes adoption and permanency as having transformative benefits. I thought that was a, a very good phrase. Um, unfortunately, um, as has been said, this process to permanency can often take a long time, and there are usually good reasons for this. And such of those are, as, as Jeremy Balfour mentioned in his speech, giving the parents every chance to get things right and assessing other prospective family members, such as grandparents. Can I just say that I think that is one of the, the, the biggest challenges that social workers and others involved in the permanency uh, arrangements face, because many times you do have parents who respond well initially, and then unfortunately it, it, it goes the other way at a later date. But I think that everybody, MD that I've ever known in social work, would want to give the parents every opportunity um, to to make sure that they get things right, but un inevitably in doing that, there has to be time given. So that would be one of the, one of the reasons that parents can often take a bit longer. 
Issues can also arise with the assessment of prospective carers, as come up as well in the, the mountains of paperwork referred to um, in social work as the Forum Fs and the Forum Es. Some people may be familiar with them. And there is often deep consideration as to whether children should be placed with their siblings, and if not, what contact arrangements might be best for them um, going forward. And again, that can be a very, very complicated process because you can have one child who has got one set of needs and another um, with another, and then their, their own permanent environments need to be taken into account as well. So there's a lot of things to be taken uh, into account in that respect. And of course, most importantly, taking into account the views of the child. Often when a child is adopted, they may be too young to contribute fully, uh, or, or at least um, verbally. Um, however, when a, children, a child is older, a permanence order uh, and a permanence order is thought their views should be at the centre of any decision. And I'm, I'm sure that that is almost always the case. I'm sure that everyone in this chamber recognises these challenges that I've outlined and understands that moving to permanency and adoption is far from a simple and straightforward process. And that is why I fully welcome the Adoption Week and the Scottish Government's commitment to this area as demonstrated in today's motion by the Minister. It's important that we use this focus to make progress in this area and what must be done to speed up the process of prospective adoptive parents and foster carers going through the checks to get them approved or rejected as quickly as possible. And I think that the, the, the motion and the amendment have recognised that and um, the, the steps that we are taking as a parliament and a country. We should recognise that you know, the excellent steps have been taken and that in 2015-16, as has been mentioned by, by a couple of other speakers, over 300 children uh, were adopted from care in Scotland. And on top of that, the, um, the, register, the Scotland's Adoption Register moving online, giving social workers and adopters a more immediate and direct involvement in the process and bringing down delays. I took the privilege of speaking to an ex-children and family colleague who is now in the family and placement uh, and adoption team. Um, just yesterday, knowing that I was speaking in this debate, I took the opportunity to speak to her about that move. And I know that, that she and her colleagues uh, are, are very excited about that and they believe as well that that will uh, be another significant uh, move forward um, in, this, in this area of work. On the issue of wider permanence, I welcome the increased funding from the, the Scottish Government in this area with the commitment of £580,000 to support improvements in the process and helping looked after children find a permanent home. And as I made mention to earlier, the commitment of the government to making progress in this area was made clear when the First Minister outlined in the programme for government that it was one of the priorities for this session of Parliament. The First Minister, as we have heard, has confirmed the Scottish Government will implement the Getting It Right for Looked After Children strategy in full by continuing the national rollout of PACE programme with aim to have it in all local authorities, um, or the majority, uh, should I say, by the spring. The change to adopter-led matching from next autumn will also see vast improvements in the system again, leading to children being placed with a family much quicker than would previously have been possible. And as is mentioned by others as well, improving outcomes is also dependent on the right support being in place to help a child deal with their circumstances emotionally. Many therapists now seek to do this work involving the permanent carers and actually advise against starting it while in temporary care as much of the focus is around building the bonds of attachment, to quote the title of one relatively famous book. Something that many of us take for granted for ourselves and for our own children, but often our looked after children have not had. This is yet another example of how the progress made by this government and this parliament as a whole will directly benefit this group of young people. So, presiding officer, to conclude, having witnessed firsthand how, a happy, how happy a child and adoptive parents can be when they start their family life together. I am so pleased that this government is making this area a key focus of its early agenda, and I look forward to working with the Scottish Government to ensure the best possible solution for Scotland's children and adoptive parents. Thank you. Ian Gray to be followed by Rona Mackay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Most speakers have commented, I think, on uh, how consensual and positive this afternoon's debate has been. Too often uh, we tend to use that as a euphemism, I think, for dull. Um, but I think, I think that's not the case today. I think, I, think the key, no, I think the key today is that today's debate and topic very much goes to the heart of some pretty profound and fundamental human needs and desires common to us all. The importance of nurturing and parenting as adults, 
and the need for security, love and attachment to a parent in childhood are really at the emotional core of the human condition. Uh, and in modern days, uh, and most speakers have mentioned this, attachment theory has researched and described the importance of all this in a very formal way. But it's something I think we all know and feel pretty instinctively too. But that doesn't mean that we all benefit from it or that we get it right. And far too many children in Scotland today, for one reason or another, are denied that unconditional love of a parent eh, or parents in their birth family. We've talked often recently of the importance of corporate parenting for those looked after children. And we are beginning, I think, to accept and understand what is meant by the obligations of that role. The, First Minister herself has promised to take her role as corporate parent seriously and to seek to improve the ways in which we discharge that obligation, and that is very, very welcome. But today's debate begins with the knowledge, I think, that the permanence of a placement with a family is a better outcome, and for many, if not all children, an adoptive parent is going to be so much better than a corporate parent, no matter how good uh, or well-meaning they might be. It is not necessarily an easier outcome, though. It's certainly my view that trying to be a good parent is perhaps the hardest thing uh, that most of us ever try to do. And for children, too, living with parents, even in the love and security of the family, can be at times a challenge. How much more so, then, for adoptive parents and adopted children? Apart from anything else, a child leaving care for adoption is almost certainly already profoundly hurt and hurting. After all, thankfully, we no longer see children given up for adoption, for example, because, simply because they were born uh, illegitimately. But that means, and Adoption UK tells us, that it means the majority of children who are adopted have suffered from abuse or neglect prior to care and, ado and adoption. Adoption UK say that the likelihood of children who are adopted not being affected by prenatal domestic abuse, substance abuse or alcohol abuse is slim uh, indeed. Jenny Gilruth made the point that adoption is uh, not just about babies and indeed the average age of adoption uh, is around two and that means that uh, a child who has lived the first two years or more of their life uh, uh, facing abuse and neglect, will almost certainly suffer from attachment disorder, having failed to form normal attachments in their early years. Instead, having learned a lack of basic trust through abuse and separation from those who should have provided uh, care. How could it be otherwise? That lack of trust has been learned by direct experience and the reality of their life. So if parenting is hard then, uh, adoption, adoptive parenting must be harder still. Uh, and uh, Jeremy Balfour was, was right to say that if there are 14,000 or more looked after children and we place only 500 children a year uh, and only half of that 500 in stranger placements, uh, then that does show that we have a very long way to go uh, to meet the need. The 2007 review in legislation uh, which followed that, tried to help with that, I think, and the Minister has acknowledged that. It streamlined the process. It led to the introduction later of the adoption register. Uh, and the Act recognised, importantly, for the first time, that families come in many diverse shapes and sizes, uh, all valid, all able to provide the kind of love and care that we want uh, for uh, uh, adopted children. It opened the doors to many more people becoming adoptive parents who had previously been excluded. The Adoption Activity Days, which the Minister talked about, is one of the latest ways in which we can try to move towards uh, closing that gap between need and what's provided. Yet SPICE figures do show that that 500-ish figure uh, of placements has remained unchanged since 2011. So we have to acknowledge that progress has been uh, slow. And Dr Robinson's evaluation of the Adoption Activity Day it gives a snapshot of 149 children seeking a placement 
but only 61 families. So the gap is, is there and we do have much work to do. So the government is to be congratulated on their efforts on Adoption Week, the promotion of exchange days and activity days and their efforts to try and raise the numbers of successful adoptions. That's only half the story, though, because Adoption UK also tell us that one in four adoptive families are at risk of breaking down due to a lack of post-adoption support. They say families are desperate for help, help with parenting and support for children facing the challenges of moving on from their early life uh, trauma. I guess in the same way as one doesn't stop becoming a parent when your children become parents themselves, but you take on a new and different role of being a grandparent, we as corporate parents don't stop being corporate parents when a child is adopted. We still have a role and an obligation, though it may be uh, different. And I'm delighted that in my own constituency, uh, we have a project in North Berwick Cluster Schools trying to find ways to improve the support adopted children get from teachers and from schools. But that, as Monica Lennon said, is something that all adoptive families and adopted children should be able to expect wherever they go to school, as is additional support from other children's services, uh, not least CAMS. The Minister spoke of starts and milestones on this critical journey. That additional support for adoptive families has to be part of that journey. And that is what Labour's amendment this evening makes clear. And I'm pleased uh, that the Minister will be able to accept the amendment this evening. Rona Mackay, followed by Alison Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to start my contribution to the debate today on a happy note. Two close friends of mine who are in a same-sex marriage have just gone through the adoption process and are hoping to welcome their new arrival to their home within the next few months. Everyone who knows them are in no doubt that they will make fabulous parents and their child will grow up in a household of love and safety. In my view, this indicates two things. Firstly, that we've moved on vastly as a society from the days when it was thought that only the traditional nuclear family, family model would work as a framework for adoption or permanence. Secondly, the single most important thing is that children are brought up in a safe, happy and loving home with parents who nurture them and give them the tools to be well-rounded, decent adults. Presiding officer, like everyone in the debate today, I welcome the first ever Adoption Week Scotland, which is taking place this week. The Scottish Government's aim is for Scotland to be the best place in the world for children to grow up, regardless of their background or what circumstances they're born into. Make no mistake, the ideal place for children to grow up is at home with their natural parents. But as we all know, for many children and for many different reasons, this is not always possible. One of the saddest things I experienced during my years as a children's panel member was witnessing a mother with an addiction problem read out a letter of thanks to her toddler son's foster mother who was sitting next to her. With tears streaming down her face, she spoke of her gratitude that someone had offered her little boy the chance of a better life, a life she knew she could not give him. Everyone in the room could see that that child was thriving due to being nurtured in a family home. That's why it's vital that there are effective, confident professionals who can support children into alternative care placements, whether through adoption or a permanence order. As the Minister outlined, more than 300 families have now adopted children through Scotland's ad adoption register. But sadly, there are more than twice as many children on the register needing a family than prospective adopters offering one. This month, Scotland's adoption register has moved to an online system which gives adopters and social workers direct involvement faster and it will reduce delays and find the best possible matches between children and families. Presiding officer deciding to adopt is a life-changing event and is never a decision taken lightly. It can be a long and sometimes stressful process for prospective adopters who are put through rigorous checks and stringent suitability tests. This is simply because we have to get it right for every child and the Scottish Government is constantly striving to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of the adoption and permanence order process, including the introduction of adopter-led matching this year, as has been previously mentioned. We're providing hands-on expert support to local authorities to help children achieve permanence through the Permanence and Care Excellent programme known as PACE. 
It brings local authority agencies and professionals, the children's hearing system and health services together to improve and speed up processes. Presiding officer, the, agen the agency Scottish adoption has this year been awarded top marks across the board by the care inspectorate. And this is just one of the many valued uh, agencies and volunteers supporting people through the adoption process. I think a fitting way to conclude would be to listen to the experience of one adoptive parent who said, with the support of Scottish adoption, we've been able to parent one child therapeutically to help him develop from an anxious, frightened child to a loving, caring, funny and charming young man. He's still only very young, but thanks to this, the support we have received, we now realise that we, as parents, have what it takes to support him on his journey to greatness. Adoption has been far, been far more challenging than we could ever have realised when sitting in the room at that first information meeting, but by far it's the best thing that we could ever have done in our lives. Presiding officer, this is proof, if it were ever needed, that the rewards outweigh any challenges and that loving and nurturing a child, whether biological or not, is beyond compare. I'm happy to support this motion and the Labour amendment. Alison Johnson, followed by Tavish Scott. Um, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I too will be supporting both the Government's motion and the Labour amendment at decision time this evening. Um, it's true this afternoon that we are enjoying a, a consensual debate, and rightly so, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to contribute to that debate. If we are to truly meet our goal of providing the best start in life for every child, we must ensure our looked after children have a smooth and quick journey into a stable and nurturing family environment. And I welcome the opportunity that the first Adoption Week Scotland brings us to raise awareness of the needs of looked after children and the positive life-changing opportunity that becoming an adoptive parent can be. However, we know that getting children into permanent adoption or long-term fostering placements is no simple task. Lack of information on a child's individual journey through the care system can be a barrier to finding that permanent home, and carers must be fully supported and resourced to provide that loving home. We have seen success in lowering the numbers of looked after children over the last three years. However, the percentage of those children and young people needing to be accommodated in care placements outside of their family home has risen by 18% over the past five years. Often, children and young people in this position face a long and uncertain process with multiple placements with foster carers or in residential homes. Uh, as noted by Strathclyde University Centre for Excellence for Looked After Children, the clock on a child's childhood never stops ticking. It is our responsibility as corporate parents to ensure that decisions on permanent homes can be made as quickly and effectively as possible so that young people can begin to build the normal, everyday childhood experiences that will support them into their adult lives, that will offer them memories and help develop resilience. And that's why I too welcome the rollout of the PACE programme across Scotland. By improving local authorities' ability to make informed decisions about a child's route to a permanent home through better data recording and information sharing, more looked after children can be settled quickly with minimum disruption to their lives. And where PACE has been trialled in Aberdeenshire, there has been marked reductions in decision-making times. In 2013 to 14, the majority of decisions took over 20 weeks to be determined. But from April 2015 to April of this year, all of the decisions have taken place in less than 20 weeks. This is a very positive difference. And it's also crucial that once children have been adopted or placed in long-term foster care, adequate support services are in place for their families and carers. I think Ian Gray made this point very well. The Scottish Green support calls by the fostering network for a national minimum fostering allowance, ending the disparity in financial support currently provided by local authorities. Edinburgh Council pays foster carers a standard allowance of of just over £100 a week, but this varies across Scotland, with allowances ranging from £77 to £205 per week. Um, the Welsh Government, for example, have a national minimum allowance 
to end this discrepancy in fostering allowances. And I'd be grateful for the, the Minister's comments on this issue when summing up. I mean, this was something that I raised when a councillor in Edinburgh from 2007 to 11. If Edinburgh's allowances are mid-range, yet its housing costs are some of the highest in the country, that financial cost can be a barrier to, to many people who would be very interested in fostering or perhaps adopting. But it's not only foster, it's not only financial barriers that exist. The myths that Jeremy Balfour um, referred to, we, we, have to exp you know, we have to really expose these myths and take positive action, and I'm pleased that is occurring. There's a growing awareness that people from all walks of life, with all sorts of homes and all sorts of jobs, can provide the homes that looked after children need. There's positive action happening too. I mean, Edinburgh Leisure have a looked after and active membership, providing free swimming, gym and fitness classes to looked after children and their carers. So supporting adoptive families not only ensures that young people have a stable place in life, but it supports the wider community that the child is part of. For example, by reducing disruption in school and behavioural problems that could impact their classmates. Now, I'm, I'm sure you'll all have received a great deal of correspondence this week, but I've been contacted by adoptive parents living in the Lothian region ahead of this afternoon's debate. And they've requested that the Scottish Government look at providing a support package similar to that received by adoptive parents in England. And one of their key asks is that their child's teachers are understanding of their additional needs and have the confidence, the support, the capacity to provide extra learning support as required. Because we know that children who have been looked after are more likely to be excluded from school, more likely to leave education at the earliest opportunity, and teachers have a crucial role to play in boosting children's confidence to do well in school. And since the beginning of this session, my parliamentary Green colleague Ross Greer has been highlighting the falling numbers of additional support for learning teachers in our school and the crucial role they play in closing the attainment gap. And um, Liz Smith referred to that attainment gap in her speech. So this is an area of concern. I note with concern too that the number of looked after children entering further and higher education fell last year. And while the reasons behind this have yet to be drawn out, the role of teachers in supporting children to take those first steps beyond school cannot be underestimated. A report by the Rees Centre on the educational progress of looked after children in England highlighted the, important of the importance of teachers as role models for young people, helping them to build skills and aspirations for their adulthood. And having a disrupted start in life shouldn't prevent our young people aiming for success in their future. And additional support for learning staff can be a vital source of encouragement, encouraging young people to aim high. The Celebrating Success Report, commissioned by the Scottish Government in 2006, spoke to 30 looked after children and found that those who'd gone on to achieve success in adulthood had been encouraged to have high expectations by their teachers. We all appreciate the decisions about adoption need to be well informed and made without unnecessary delay, and I welcome the rollout of PACE to give the positive results for looked after children that we all hope for. Um, in summary, Presiding Officer, I too thank all those who provide a secure, stable and nurturing home for children and young people who have suffered neglect and trauma. Finding that right fit can be very challenging, and even when we found that fit, many challenges remain, and ongoing support for the whole family is essential. I would ask that we come back to this issue on a regular basis. As corporate parents, we have a responsibility to look after our youngest and most vulnerable citizens. Thank you. Tavish Scott to be followed by Gillian Martin. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Everything that needs to be said has already been said, but since no one was listening, everything needs to be said again, which actually strikes me as a very unfair quote to use in a debate like this, um, uh, so I won't use it. Uh, but uh, having used it, I, I thought I'd just... Um, uh, uh, that was my way of doing the Ian Gray um, when we have consensual debates, then sometimes everyone thinks they're dull. Actually, uh, I've learned a lot by listening to um, a variety of members across the um, chamber this afternoon, but I did want to thank Mark Macdonald in his opening remarks for his observations about Hugh Henry and uh, Robert Brown. Um, by the powers of uh, Facebook, I let Robert Brown know that uh, uh, he'd been commended in a debate by a, uh, an SNP minister of a subsequent government for the work he'd done uh, in a previous uh, ministerial life. 
um, and uh, he was suitably impressed. So uh, Mark McDonald will probably get a Christmas card this year, uh, uh, one of many, I no doubt. Um, but I do want to, I do want to uh, reflect that, and Liz Smith mentioned that too, I do want to reflect that uh, there was an awful lot of work that's gone into this area over uh, much time uh, involving um, many politicians of many different hues in uh, a, a really genuine attempt to find uh, stronger and more positive ways forward in a challenging area of public uh, policy. Um, we've all, as uh, others have said, got friends and, and family who uh, have adopted our adopted parents or have been through the adoption uh, process. And I'm going to take this opportunity to uh, say uh, hello to um, my first cousin, Will, and his partner and their fantastic daughter, Monique, although they do live in Canada, so I'm not quite sure if Scottish Parliament television ever gets that far. I hope not in many ways, but, uh, uh, but uh, they, uh, they did tell me the last time I was in Canada staying with, with the family what that adoption process was like. Um, and I wish I'd taken a few notes because it might have been uh, useful uh, today. Uh, I, I take the Minister's point that he made in his opening remarks about adoption activity days and the uh, range of activities that have, have been introduced. They strike me as um, constructive, uh, sensible and indeed uh, hopefully uh, have the ability to inspire uh, many because Adoption Week across Scotland uh, and this debate are important signals and indeed, indeed symbols. But Parliament must challenge uh, signals uh, and make uh, the measures that have been uh, to some extent talked about today very tangible for children and young people desperately in need of our help. Uh, as others have said, adoption provides a stable family life for children who, for whatever reason, would not necessarily have that life with their birth parents. For parents who cannot or choose not to have children themselves, adoption is a way of building that loving uh, family. And for the majority of those families, adoption is successful and helps children to thrive. Uh, as any parent knows, uh, raising a child always has its challenges. Uh, in cases of adoption, these challenges can be even more difficult to overcome given the uh, support services, or rather the lack of support services that members have mentioned this afternoon, available once the formal adoption papers have signed. And I take the Minister's point that he's reflecting on that, uh, and there's clearly more that needs to be done, and some of that was reflected in, the, in Monica Lennon's speech and, in, uh, and indeed in the Labour um, amendment. Research illustrates that up to a quarter of adoptions are at risk of breaking down, which by any standards must be a um, pretty worrying statistic. And in, and in Scotland here, that equates to um, some 125 children each year. That's 125 children that are returning to the care system. For older children, it is a system that they thought they had left uh, forever. So we must certainly seek to understand why that is and take the necessary actions to uh, challenge uh, that uh, worrying case. Adoption breakdowns can, of course, be caused by a variety of of matters. Adoption UK has noted that its members are in desperate need of those support services, ranging from guidance for parents to more help for children within schools. If these services uh, are not being provided, we need to ask uh, whether we are content to let some of our most vulnerable children move through life without the support they need, simply because they have not uh, because they have ceased to have ceased to be the responsibility uh, of the state, and that uh, cannot be right, presiding officer. Uh, where support is available, there is a view from parents and sadly the authorities that to ask uh, for that support is at times a sign uh, of weakness. Uh, one family sought support for one of their ch children many years after the adoption had been finalised, only to be told that if they took the request further, all three of their children uh, would be temporarily taken from them. The, uh, that adoption, not unsurprisingly, subsequently broke down. So adoptive parents must be given the assurances that seeking help is not any, in any way a sign of being a bad parent. After all, we all do it in every walk of life. On the contrary, it signifies that they're trying to do the best for their child. Often families adopt without a full picture, after all, of the child's background, no matter how good all the reports uh, can be. So coping with unknown challenges uh, can and is, of course, immensely difficult, and we need to reflect on that in how these matters are taken forward. Uh, we know that looked after children tend to leave school earlier and with fewer qualifications, a point that Alison Johnson has just made. Teachers are very alive to the importance of monitoring that attainment of looked after children, and this is uh, right. However, teachers may not always be aware when a pupil is from an adoptive background, and we do need to strike the balance here. There can be uh, 
few adoptive parents who wish to see their child continually monitored and treated differently from their classmates to say nothing of the child themselves, that would undo much of the work to create a normal family life. But we need to make sure that adopted children do, do not slip through uh, any uh, unenforced cracks. Providing guidance through teacher training and uh, professional development programmes for qualified teachers could start to address this challenge. Uh, children spend upwards of 30 hours a week in school, so it cannot be right that the needs of adopted children are not formally assessed and taken into account by their teachers. Adoption UK's pilot project in North Berwick that's already been mentioned includes providing attainment training for teachers and support staff. And if we are going to create a better learning environment for adopted children, the people we trust to teach them must be properly equipped to do their job. Now, I am conscious, as others, of the um, weight of requests we make of uh, teachers. I'm reading uh, papers for tomorrow's Education Committee, and it is up to here with teachers um, making representations, as I'm sure Liz Smith has read, before, uh, read as well, uh, on the workload in the context of Education Scotland and the, Scottish, and the SQA. So here we are in another context asking teachers to yet take forward yet more um, requirements on their time uh, when they cha they're challenged pretty strongly by the day job as it is. Uh, of course, this whole area has to be part of the day job, but it's that balance that um, has to be struck. Uh, the First Minister, um, rightly in my view, is focused on the need to improve the lives of children within the care system. Uh, this, year's, sorry, this week's adoption week has demonstrated the importance of making sure that adopted children and their families are supported too. The least we owe these children, our children, is the reassurance that we will work together through the agencies, government and parliament to give them a stable environment to grow up in. That's the very least we can do. Gillian Martin, followed by Miles Briggs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to start my contribution to today's debate by recognising the achievements of Aberdeenshire Council in achieving their aims with regard to early permanence for children in need of a caring, stable home and family. The Aberdeenshire PACE Group's aim states this. Each child will live in a stable, safe, secure and happy home where they know they will stay until independent and where they can make lifelong connections. But they actually went further than that. They set themselves a measurable target, which was this. 90% of children will be accommodated before their 12th birthday and will have a permanence plan within nine months. They met that target in January 2016 and are working hard to sustain it and improve on it for future years. And last week, their achievements were recognised when Aberdeenshire Council won the Herald Society's Young People's Project of the Year Award and at the 2016 Quality Improvement Awards, they won the outstanding contribution to improving outcomes for children, young people and families. And one of the things, some of the things that they did to, to achieve those awards was around the idea of support, which many people have, have mentioned today. Um, it's, it's not just enough to put a child with a family. You need to give them that support to make sure that the adoption flourishes and, and, and does what it should for, for, for both the, the parents and the child. They have programmes for peer support from other adoptive parents. Who best to know what adopt, newly adoptive parents are going through than those who have been through it themselves? They've got training and coaching opportunities for prospective adoptive, adopting parents um, and they you know, are available um, as many times as prospective adoptive parents need them to answer any questions they may have and provide support. They've also got support groups for adoptive children and looked after children. And I want to mention one group, um, the WIPOC group, who are the Young People's Organising and Campaign Group in Aberdeenshire, who do many of the things that Tavish Scott's just been mentioning there. I don't think it's just incumbent upon teachers to know how to, um, to, to train and, and learn how to um, work with children who've been in care. I think it's really important that those children who've been in care take ownership of their situation. And the YPOC group, who are making pizzas with in a couple of weeks, um, so we'll see how that goes. Um, the YPOC group, they've produced materials for teachers to know how, to, how they feel when they're in meetings or to know the issues that they face. And they've also produced, and I would highly recommend you look at their fantastic DVD that they made themselves to highlight some of the issues that they face in school. 
A society should be judged on how they treat their most vulnerable. Well, that's a variations on that quote abound in our arguments as to who first made it, but it's so relevant here. There's no one more vulnerable than a child without a loving, caring protector. The longer children experience uncertainty in their life, the more damage is done. The sooner children can be settled in a permanent home with their new family, the higher their chances. And a couple of months ago, I had the privilege to spend an afternoon with Laura and Shadell from Who Cares? Both of these exceptional women um, had been what we call cared for children, but they had two vastly different experiences. Shadell and her little brother had been badly neglected by their birth mother, but they'd been given a new permanent home early and were able to grow up in a loving, stable environment. And it was by no means plain sailing. Shadell and her foster mum, Hazel, who she calls mum, still had to cope with her childhood trauma and unsettling, sporadic, unwanted contact from her birth mother made things very difficult at points. But she and her brother had a loving family who were there for them no matter what. And the confident, bright, compassionate Shadell is living proof that early permanence can make a world of difference to a young person. Contrast her experience with that of Laura, who moved from foster carer to foster carer, to children's home, to even to a secure unit where she was locked in at night, supposedly for her own protection. Lack of early permanence was the start of a downward spiral for this young woman. And she told me, she told me this, which I'll, I'll never forget these words. She just wanted someone to claim her. I'll never forget that, because I think that's what it's about. She said, I just wanted someone to claim me. Warts and all, difficulties and all, and all. She, she needs someone just to take her on board. All of us here, I imagine, get into politics to make a difference, and of course, people throughout the whole country give money to children in need and whatever, but I'm reminded of a conversation I had with a social worker that I know who said the biggest difference any single person can make is to give a child a loving and a secure home. A child, for whatever reason, is a risk to their well-being in their birth home, is confused, scared and vulnerable. And it will become more vulnerable the more transient, temporary and numerous their moves are from place to place. I'd urge anyone who's been watching this debate to look at the work that Who Cares does and have a look at the recent documentary that was on STV called Who, Who Cares. The strongest voices are those that have been through the care system and two of those voices are Laura and Shadell's. The two of them are ambassadors for looked after children and their message is simple. Vulnerable children need to be loved and feel secure as quickly as possible so that they can start their journey towards being ordinary kids with ordinary but safe and happy lives. Early permanence through adoption is key to that, and I fully support the government's prioritising that, that goal and the strategy that takes new approaches in line with the recommendations made by those who know the situations best, the adoptive parents and the looked after children who have been through this whole system before. Miles Briggs, followed by Elaine Smith. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I'm pleased to take part in today's debate. And as we mark the first ever Adoption Week in Scotland, I want to start my comments by paying tribute to those individuals and couples across the Lothian region I represent who do foster and adopt children. Children who are some of the most vulnerable members of our society and often in considerable distress. The contribution they make is a great one and we should be acknowledging this commend their efforts and look at every possibility and every way we can help support them. Children need stability and routine in their home lives to allow them to have the confidence to develop and flourish, establish friendships and make progress in education. And we want to see more people become fosterers and adopters, more fosterers go on to becoming adopters and adoption made easier and less bureaucratic. I very much share the concerns about the length of time it takes to secure an adoption, with the average time now more than two years from initial contact. This must be reduced, and I welcome the Scottish Government's recognition of this in the motion today. Many individuals and families who want to adopt are looking to ministers to deliver the improvements that are required, and for these changes to be brought forward at the earliest opportunity. Scottish Conservatives welcome the creation of Scotland's adoption register and we were pleased that the investment has been provided to bring the services fully online, which will hopefully speed up matching of children 
with adoptive parents. And we believe that the time is right for the guidance to local authorities now to also be looked at, as it's five years since that was drawn up, and for this to be reviewed and refreshed to identify any delays local government policy is potentially bringing to the process. Alison Johnston outlined the fact that we've received a number of emails from constituents in the last few days who've raised, spe who've raised spe specific issues around foster care allowance. While many constituents have emphasised the fact that they do not foster to make any financial gain, it's appropriate that these concerns are actually looked at. And I hope, if I write to the Minister, we can take these forward in terms of variation in costs, which many foster parents find, especially living in more expensive communities um, like Edinburgh. Both the Fostering Network and an Adoption Register have spoken out publicly about the lack of foster and adoptive parents in Scotland. And I hope today we can all unite in sending out a message that we would encourage many of our constituents and more of our constituents to consider fo fostering and adopting. In Edinburgh, an extensive advertising campaign has literally placed this issue on the streets, with billboards being placed in communities across the city to encourage people to consider fostering. And I would welcome any insight on ministers of how this is being developed and how more public information campaigns can be brought forward, as well as how effective is the advertising currently being used. For example, it was suggested to me that the regular information, that regular information sessions in supermarkets and shopping centres may actually help individuals and families who may consider fo fostering to give them an opportunity to actually, actually discuss these issues informally. It's also been put to me that perhaps every council tax bill should include information on fostering. Personally, I'm not sure that we delivered the exact de desired outcome we all want to see, but it has been suggested. And one of the issues which I've raised in this chamber a number of times now is how social media is changing how people access information. And I think there's a great opportunity for Facebook, for example, and the geographical advertising they can be um, can undertake to try to get them on board with a lot of this so we can try to advertise the opportunities and what a great um, opportunity it is for many families to adopt children and I hope that's something the Minister will take on board. As the Minister has said many hundreds of foster and adoptive parents are needed to give homes to look after children. Adopting and fostering can be an incredibly rewarding opportunity for parents of all ages and all backgrounds and we need to require them to come forward. As adopters and fosters are especially needed for children in their early teens and children who have complicated needs, including physical and learning disabilities, this is something which I think we also need to um, try to see how we can better um, develop our advertising around. Sadly, it's the case that the older children become, the harder it is for them to find adoptive families to take care of them. And we need to look at how we can ensure teenagers can benefit as well as younger children and babies. As well as local authorities fostering and adoption services, we should also recognise the important and very valuable role of the voluntary sector in this area, both in terms of local and national charities and independent charitable fostering and adoption agencies. Ian Gray, who I think has left the chamber at the moment, outlined the importance of ongoing support for families. And as Tavish Scott has mentioned, a quarter, a quarter of, uh, of adoptions break down, sadly. And so I think we need to look at how the work is ongoing in these areas is. Bedardo Scotland offer effective training to help new adoptive parents as they step, step into their roles and ongoing support after children have been placed, including group meetings organised by their own social workers. These meetings are attended by potential adopters who's waiting for, who are waiting for a child. And these and in Edinburgh, we have St Andrew's Children's Society, who also hosts the Adoption mm -hmm. Register, who have a long-standing and high reputation of excellence. Scottish adoption can also do, also do first class work in this area. And I commend, and they were commended recently by the Care Inspectorate, um, being awarded top marks across the board and winning praise for the range, variety, and accessibility of the post placement support which they provide. Post placement support is really important as it's the sharing of knowledge, tips, and ex experience among experienced fosterers and adopters and those looking to foster and adopt for the first time. And to conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, I'd like to once again welcome the fact we've got this debate and the, consensus appro the, con the consensual approach which we've all taken and look forward to progress being made so that more children in, in care are benefiting from the potential to be fostered 
and adopt it. And I just make one um, final point, which I hope ministers will take on board, and that is regarding um, teachers and their ability to identify children in their class who are either adopted, but also those who are young carers. Because I know from attending a young carer conference, this is one issue which was flagged up to all the MSPs who attended that, and I haven't really seen anything um, since that in how we can move that forward. So finally, Deputy Presiding Officer, I hope the message we can all take from today's debate is that these children are all our responsibility, and we must make sure that we work to build the best possible life and future for them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Briggs. I call Lane Smith to be followed by Bob Doris. Ms Smith, please. Thank you, President Officer. Can I um, begin, like others, by welcoming the first Adoption Week in Scotland? It's something I think that is much needed to raise awareness of the specific issues um, of those children that those children who are adopted face, but also the issues that families who adopt face when adding new members to their family. But it's also a chance to celebrate adoption. There can be nothing more important than caring for our children and those who are foster carers, kinship carers and adoptive parents contribute immensely to our society. So it's absolutely right that we take the opportunity today to thank them all. Today the main focus is on adoption and it's an example of the kind of generous compassion that not only helps the family and the adopted child but the whole of society as well. And we should, of course, um, thank the voluntary organisations who work in the field, as the Minister did at the beginning of the debate, uh, the ones that he mentioned. But there are also others, such as St Margaret's Child and Family Care Society in Glasgow, and, of course, all the NHS, local authority and public sector staff involved too, who deserve thanks. We all know the problems that young people who have been adopted can face before their adoption, and sadly, that's often something that can continue afterwards also. And though we don't have comparable data for Scotland, we know that the majority of children adopted in England have suffered from abuse and or neglect prior to adoption. By increasing the chances that a child will stay with their adopted family and feel welcomed into the everyday structures that many other children take for granted, like school, sports, friendship groups, then we can ensure that they are given the best chance to flourish, even when they might not have had the best start in life. This would then, I think, be the fresh start that they very much deserve. We should reflect on the problems that children in care face too and recognise the advancements that have been made in assisting them in recent years, particularly, I think, with increasing the age limit to stay on with families. But a great deal more does uh, need to be done. We know, for example, that children in care are four times more likely to suffer a mental health difficulty. And as such, I welcome the Scottish Government's indication, uh, as mentioned by Fulton McGregor earlier, that they'll carry out a root and branch review of Scotland's care system. And I hope that this will include the experiences of children who have gone through care at the heart of it. And perhaps in the summing up, the Minister could give us a bit more detail um, as to the nature of that review and when it is going to begin. Um, unfortunately, of course, we know the state has not always been a great guardian for many children and we know that children in care are less likely than their peers to do well at school and some have experienced further neglect and abuse whilst in care. So any future review of the care system in Scotland has got to take these issues into account and reflect on the reality that getting as many kids into adopted families as possible is a beneficial outcome for all. After all, we know that children adopted uh, from care do very well compared with those who remain in care, and that was something specifically included in the Adoption UK briefing that, that we received for this debate. If we look after children well and we build up their opportunities, we will construct a solid foundation in which Scotland and its children can flourish. And so I am pleased to support the amendment proposed by Monica Lennon, and I am also pleased that the government has indicated that they will be doing so too. And this more broadly reflects um, some of the specific reforms that we should be pursuing in order to improve the lives of families who adopt. To achieve this, I think if we, if we achieve this adoption, if we're going to achieve this, adoption is going to have to be seen as a more appealing prospect to families and hopeful new parents. And by increasing the support provided to those who adopt from care, I'm sure that we will gradually see numbers of children being taken out of care and into welcoming permanent homes where they can feel that they belong. As we know, um, five, only 500 children were adopted in Scotland last year. And I think to improve this, we need to focus on uh, three things, as raised by my comrade Monica Lennon. First of all, giving every adoptive family the right to support when they need it. Secondly, giving every adopted child the right to additional support in school. And taking into, into consideration what the minister, the minister said in his opening statement, 
giving every adopted child quick access to child and adolescent mental health services. I think parity with looked after children presiding officer is important. Now, I know that this is essentially a consensual debate, and many members have made that point. However, I think it is important to take note of the reality that local authorities are having to face. Local government funding is being cut again this year, on top of cuts in previous years, and we have only very recently seen the announcement of an end to the 10-year council tax freeze. So, with this in mind, local authorities finding further extra money to support um, adopted children and families will be no easy task, and that is a reality that I'm afraid can't be ignored. Local authorities need to be properly resourced. In taking forward improvements, we should learn from the process in the last parliament in which policy was informed by those who had experienced care, and we should do the same for those who are adopted. I would imagine that very few of us know firsthand about the unique experiences of those who have been adopted um, and or were in care, and that's an expertise that needs to inform the way forward, since the people who understand adoption on a personal level are a fundamental resource for us. Um, I'm just coming to a conclusion, but I would like to mention two cases, if you wish to call them that, that I know about. Um, when I was a young kid, I personally witnessed a young child being told by other children that they were adopted, and I was personally affected by that. I can remember it very, very well. Because that kind of thing can have a real ongoing negative effect and it shows the need for support for families and explaining to children and for children to access their own support as needed. On the other hand, presiding officer, um, I personally know of a, an adopted child um, from a Catholic family who felt special and was delighted that they had been specifically chosen by their family. And the reason I mentioned it from a Catholic family is because they said that they felt lucky to have three mothers, and they said this at a very young age, their birth mother, their real mum, and our lady. So that was, that was obviously um, a much better experience. So in coming to a conclusion, I think we can be in no doubt that family life can be greatly enhanced by adoption, both for the child and the parents. And I believe that the state has a duty to make that as easy as possible for them, and in turn, this will benefit all of society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms Smith. I call Bob Doris. You followed by Maurice Corrie. Mr Doris, please. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I welcome this debate being held during this first ever Adoption Week in Scotland. I also welcome the consensual points that have been raised in relation to the benefit of the Adoption and Children Scotland Act 2007, the, the benefits of the adoption register in Scotland and over 300 families now seeing a real benefit and more importantly the children seeing a benefit from that and of course the new monies announced by uh, the Minister today will be very welcome indeed. Uh, the Scottish Government's Looked After Children and Young People Strategy was published in November 2015. It's worth noting these priorities in Parliament this afternoon. That is to support families early to prevent children becoming looked after in the first place early permanence when required, as previously been referred to by a number of speakers in this debate, and to make sure every child receives the best care and support required. I would like to take a slightly different approach during this debate, because I would like to commend the role of kinship carers as part of this strategy, and all they do is prevent children becoming accommodated in the first place, and indeed easing pressures on adoption services as a consequence. The kinship carers I have met across my constituency of Maryhill and Springburn and beyond, I have to say, do exceptional and vital work. In particular, I want to mention the group Kinship for the North, who previously were run by Jessie Harvey, a formidable, wonderful lady, and currently by Sadie Pryor doing another sterling job on behalf of that organisation. I have been happy and privileged to work with them over a, a number of years. Of course, I thank them for all that they do. However, they do not actually want my thanks. They wish appropriate support, help and assistance, not for them, but for the children they care for. A successful kinship care arrangement saves a significant financial outlay, given the alternative expensive residential options that council would have to pay for otherwise. The life outcomes of young people in kinship care is also far better, on average, eh, compared to looked after and accommodated children. That is crucial, happier, healthier and greater life chances. That is what it is all about for all of us. Um, Ahead of my election in 2007, I made a commitment to kinship carers with regards to financial support and fighting for parity with foster carers. The Scottish Government, over a number of years, uh, staging it in, worked towards that goal and finally fully realised that ambition in 2015 with a £10 million commitment. 
I thoroughly welcome that, and of course we're proud to achieve that. But this is not 2015, this is 2016, of course, and kinship carers as well as foster carers and adoptive families quite rightly have a fresh set of asks. At my most recent meeting with Kinship for the North and Postle Park, we discussed how peer support for kinship carers and peer advice needs to be better supported. I am well aware of the Children First Advice Line for Kinship Care, and I welcome it. However, SEDA discussed with me a national volunteer-led model of advice and peer support for kinship carers that, along with the Scottish Kinship Care Alliance, kinship carers that I work with are keen to develop. I understand, Minister, that your officials may have had some initial representations in relation to this initiative, but I would actually like to extend an invite to you to come out and meet the kinship carers for Kinship for the North Group in Postle Park. Meet the carers, talk to them about their needs, talk to them about the potential of a national network of peer support and advice that they're happy to be involved in uh, on a volunteer basis. They would love to see you in our constituency. Clearly, one way of easing pressure on adoption services is by having young people less likely to be needing to be adopted in the first place, as I said at the outset. That places kin uh, kinship carers front and centre in realising that ambition. I was actually struck, moving on from kinship care, I was actually struck by the contribution by Monica Lennon in connection to ongoing support for adoptive families. Young people don't stop having significant needs simply because they become adopted. That's not how it works. Also, Ms Lennon noted calls around a fair deal for adoptive families in relation to school, in relation to child and adolescent mental health services and a variety of wider support needs. All powerful points, of course. Those key asks have been long-term campaign goals for kinship carers also. And I'm sure the Minister will consider the points raised by Ms Lennon, but look at it in the round to make sure whether it's foster carers, kinship carers or adoptive families, that there's equity of service for all groups. Because it's not about those caring for the young people, it's about the young people with needs themselves. Um, the final contribution that I would like to make, Presiding Officer, was in relation to the, the idea of early permanence. And I was actually again struck by something Fulton McGregor said in relation to that early permanence needing sound speedy and informed decision-making. Uh, the role of an MSP is you sometimes only see families when they come to you when they're in need. And that also means families that have engaged with the social work system that are desperate to retain their children, whether it's at home or identifying a kinship care placement. There's a perception, and I'm sure it is a perception, that once social workers have made an initial decision in relation to a family, they can become entrenched within that position, and it can rule out uh, the prospect of children returning to the birth family or rule out kinship care arrangements because of a closeness between the birth family and an aunt or a gran or whatever. But I do accept the need for early permanence for the best outcome for vulnerable young people. But I just reinforce that comment. Fulton McGregor has got much more experience than I have in relation to this, that it has to be sound, it has to be speedy, but it also has to be informed, and informed by making sure that we don't needlessly rule out other potential options, of course, including kinship care as presiding officer. Thank you very much, Mr Doris. Paul Morris Corrie, to be followed by James Dorn, and James Dorn will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr <coughs> Corrie, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, May I declare my interests as a local councillor at Garland Butte Council, and also I'm a member of their uh, corporate parenting board. And I'd just like to say that uh, we look after over 200 looked after children, and I must agree with Ian Gray's comment about the responsibilities we have as members of that board to follow and monitor children once they leave us and go into adopted care or kinship care. It is something we have discussed at our last board meeting very seriously in Loch Gilphead. Uh, and we do have issues relating not just to municipal areas, but certainly the islands and the rural areas that are in our, 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 our own vines. For a child in care being brought into a loving environment and in family, it is one of the greatest gifts that they will ever receive. And for a family receiving a child to raise, to give them a loving home and parents is the most important task that they will ever undertake. The benefits of a child being adopted or fostered for the state, for the state are as many as well. Uh, the, the cost of keeping a child in residential care equates to over £150,000 per child per year. Although such financial benefits are welcome, what is more important is the positive impact that adoption has on a child's life. 
Children in residential care are less likely to go on to further education, employment or training compared to those not in residential care. Only 77% compared to the national average of 93%. They are more likely to experience homelessness. More than one in 10 young people are likely to end up homeless within two years of leaving care. What's more, they are, like, they are more likely to end up in prison. A worrying statistic in that is that UK-wide, 25% of the adult prison population have been in care compared to just 2% of the overall adult population. Getting a child adopted can lead to much more positive life changes and chances for that child, and, that, and this benefits everyone in society in the end. Such are the benefits to the child, the prospective family and the state that all work undertaken to promote and encourage adoption and fostering must be welcomed. Permanence in adoption is a very, very important aspect for a child. The long-term placement of a child, particularly in early childhood, is beneficial not only for their speech and vocabulary in their early years, but lays the foundations for better mental health and academic attainment later on into primary and secondary school. If we are going to tackle and narrow the attainment gap, we must include those children who are adopted. The longer that a child has a stable family environment, the better they should perform at school. Making sure that these children have an equal opportunity in life are those who are not adopted, should be the, and those who are not adopted should be the responsibility of us all. And I'd like to refer to a documentary recently that was on Bulgaria, uh, and which told us a story about where they were 20 years ago to now, and they've adopted the same situation of these large institutions of children who were left by their parents, couldn't afford to keep them, were put into um, state, adoption, state homes, and now they're moving to full, small family units with the view to putting them out to adoption into the, into the bigger environments of the country. And I had the privilege some years ago when I was member of NATO forces in the Balkans of actually visiting and dealing with a, a wonderful children's home in Hungary in a place called Kapishvar in the southern part of Hungary where I saw and demonstrated to me the love and care that that care home gave to those children again those 15 years ago looking to put them into smaller units and in particularly into families who stepped forward most notably some poor families but were given help by the state at that time. So the creation of a Scotland's adoption register was a, welcome step, was a welcome step in the right direction towards securing a good home for all children who need one. In particular, the decision to bring the services online will make the service radically simpler, which would dra dramatically help speed up the process of matching up families and parents. As putting the Scottish, uh, as a Scotland's adoption register online, uh, was a Scottish Conservative policy. I am delighted to see that the Scottish Government once again has taken our lead and is putting our ideas into practice. Speeding up the process should be a key aim of policy on adoption in Scotland. It is taking over two years on average to secure an adoption from a family's first involvement and with the state services. This is too long. It's unfair on both the child and the family. There are even extreme cases where it's taken up to 10 years to secure an adoption. The adoption process to register as an adopter or foster family needs to be as simple as is possible, whilst of course staying within the safe limits of checks and assessing compatibility of child and parents. New ways of speeding up this process need to be found, and we and our Corp Preparing to Board are continually discussing that very subject. It is a very, very important fact of our work. For example, refreshing the guidance uh, which was issued to local authorities in 2011 so that it follows in line with the 2014 Act, this would allow a review of the guidance which sits alongside that new legislation to take place. Hopefully, that would lead to any blockages in the local government processes which slow down the process uh, being identified and dealt with accordingly. Efforts to make families aware of the possibility for the option of adopting and fostering should also be encouraged where adoption agencies are re already doing the work effectively. As has been noted by Robin Duncan, the manager of Scotland's adoption uh, register, there simply aren't enough families for children needing to be adopted, and in particular, children who have more uh, complicated needs such as learning difficulties. It is clear that more work needs to be done to simplify and improve the system, but I am sure that working together we shall get there in good time. 
And finally, I'd like to pay a particular tribute to all those families in my West Scotland region who adopt and foster children and provide kinship care. We are all immensely grateful to them for stepping forward, uh, for giving this, this help to give these children hope and a future and, above all, love. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Corey. Call James Dorn and then move to closing speeches. Mr Dornan, please. Very much, Presiding Officer. Um, at the recent SNP conference, along with many others, I think about 3,000, I was deeply and profound, profoundly moved when the First Minister addressed the issue of care experienced kids in Scotland. These young people are entitled to have the same fair and equal opportunities as every other young person across the country. And it's not often politics that we, we talk about love, but the First Minister was absolutely right. And we've heard the word a few times today. That, but the First Minister was absolutely right when she stated that these young people deserve to be loved. There's no denying that when the young people in the audience raise those red paper hearts, that they agree completely that being loved is something which has been for years so deeply missed by some care experienced kids. However, in order for these young people to be loved and for drastic change to be made in their lives, we must look at the facts and the statistics of young people living in care are indeed deeply shocking, as many have already mentioned. Nearly half of five to 17 year olds living in care are diagnosed as having a mental health disorder. 7% of young people in care go from high school to university compared to nearly 40% of other young people. 50% of prisoners identified as having been in care at some point in their life, and 85% of young people in care leave school before the age of 16. Now, I was particularly distressed by that last statistic because 85 of these young people leaving education before the age of 16, what chance does that give them to move on and make that life that we're all entitled to? The government has been challenged with closing the attainment gap for all young people, and no specific group should be left behind. While well, leaving school early and entering apprenticeships, indeed the workplace is the right path for some young people, many of those leaving school should be going on to further and higher education in order to reach their full potential. This motion that this bill would pre present more stability for the lives of care experienced young people, which in turn would drastically reduce this horrifying statistic of 85%. No one in this chamber can argue with that or the benefits that would bring to the young people and indeed society. In my short time as a, in my role as convener of the Education and Skills Committee, it's been my pleasure to work with and have discussions with the charity Who Cares Scotland, which was mentioned by my colleague Gillian Martin. They've now been to a number of the Education and Skills events and uh, been in front of the committee. And the work being done by the staff and by the young people themselves is deeply touching. I spoke to one young lady that said, thanks to Who Cares Scotland, she's now looking forward to going on to further education and is so keen to be part of the changes in young people's lives that she can see herself entering into the field of politics, something she'd never have imagined for herself just a few short years ago. We need to see more of this. In the Who Cares Scotland manifesto, they made a commitment to challenge the First Minister and the Scottish Government to enter the terrible outcomes of care experienced young people. I believe the adoption register will go some way to accepting that gauntlet that was thrown down to the Scottish Government. As has already been said, over 300 families have now adopted children after being matched through the adoption register, with 69% of the children aged under five. And it's worth noting that a key aim of Scotland's adoption register is to increase the number of adopted children who are the most difficult to place, which takes us back to those care experienced young people. I'm delighted that, too that the register is bringing families closer together and reducing the amount of time that potential adopters and children are waiting for a placement. I uh, have got some experience of this, but a, a few years ago, my partner and I had thought about fostering or adopting, uh, and we looked into it. And part of the reason why we didn't go ahead was the complexity and the length of time it was taking, particularly around fostering, to be fair, to, to uh, uh, move forward with it. And eventually, I suppose it was more my doing than, than hers, but uh, we decided not to go ahead with it. But the Children's Social Work Statistics Scotland has shown a further decrease in the number of looked after children for the third consecutive years. Uh, and this is welcome news along with the 4% reduction of the number of children in the Child Protection Register, supported by the 19% annual increase during 2014-15 in permanence orders and orders with authority to adopt. To build on these achievements, I'm delighted the Scottish Government is working towards making the register available online in order to streamline the process even further. All these positive indicators and steps will go some way to providing a strong, stable, loving family environment that will lead towards attaining uh, at school, interacting with children and peers that will equip themselves for a successful adulthood and whatever they wish to achieve in their lives. The Looked After Children strategy reaffirms the Scottish Government's commitment to this vision of a stable, loving childhood that prepares children for fulfilling ad adulthood by improving the outcomes for looked after children. 
The strategy calls on the sector to accelerate progress by supporting families through early intervention that leads to a nurturing home, providing early permanence with the benefits of the best care and support possible, thereby increasing the quality of care. Now, the previous speaker, who uh, is no longer in the chamber, talked about Bulgaria. I um, was over in South Sudan a, a number of years ago and saw for myself the importance of somebody taking responsibility and care for people for kids that, that, that had nobody. They, that's, that's where the civil war was, it's where the child soldiers were, it was just on the border of Uganda. And there was one woman had 16 children, none of them hers. They were all orphans from, from that war. But it really was that the, the, the village makes a family. Everybody just sort of mucked in together. They all felt like they were one family. Pretty much what society used to be like a bit but has become less so over the years. But what it did was it showed the importance of somebody taking responsibility and showing care and love for those children. And the children benefited hugely from it. Many of them were going to the schools and the colleges that we were over to, uh, to visit uh, because we helped the charity I was with had helped part fund them. So anyway, this bill not only benefits the young care experience people of Scotland, but the wonderful potential parents across the country. There's been much talk across this parliament about making Scotland a fairer place to live and thrive. And we can only really accept that fairness has been achieved if no child is being left behind. The statistics which have been discussed during this debate are truly some of the most shocking I've ever seen. And that's why I'm delighted, but not surprised that the whole chamber should be absolutely committed to this motion and the amendment and supporting these young people to having the best start in life. Only then can we expect to see them flourish into happy, successful adults and become that integral part of Scottish society, which they're all capable of being. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just before I move to closing speeches, can I say I'm disappointed that Mr Corrie is not in the chamber for closing speeches. I've had no notice, no request not to be in, so perhaps that will be conveyed to him by the Conservative team to my right. Uh, we have some time in hand, so I can give Daniel Johnson an extra minute, Mr Johnson, to wind up for the Labour Party. Up to eight minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, much has been made uh, this afternoon about the positive, consensual tone... Just bear with me a minute. I'm sorry. I see that I've also failed to name Miles Briggs, who's also not in the chamber. So, no doubt that will be conveyed to him as well. Thank you. <laughs> not at all. Um, <laughs> Although you have slightly broken up my, uh, the pace of my humour, um, but, but that, that's, that's always difficult. I'm anyway. sure you can recover it. You're a stylish <laughs> um, gentleman. Um, so let me stumble through that again. There's been a positive, consensual tone in this debate. Um, but perhaps may I, I might suggest that if there's been a, a different tone, it's perhaps because we're pleased not to be debating Europe and Brexit as we've become used to doing on a Tuesday afternoon. However, I think if, if there's a reason that we've had a different... The, the, the issue of adoption was bound to strike a different tone. Not only is it an important issue, it's one with very real and human impact. So certainly, I welcome the motion that we have before us today from the government, highlighting the first ever adoption week. And again, I'd like to just echo um, Mark Macdonald's initial comments, thanking the people and the agencies involved with making adoption work in Scotland. I think they do massively important work. I'd also note his announcements on uh, adoption activity days and pace. I think everyone in this chamber would welcome every effort that is made to improve adoption, both in terms of finding placement um, uh, with families for, for uh, children who are seeking adoption, but also supporting those placements thereafter. And indeed, I think uh, Liz Smith, in some ways, uh, summed it up best by saying that there, there may well be consensus, but there must be absolutely no complacency. So, I hope that Adoption Week will be an opportunity to talk about the successes of adoption, especially for those who have only recently become allowed to adopt. I hope it will be an opportunity to dispel the myths that sometimes surround adoption. And I hope that it will be also an opportunity to put adoption into the context of looked after children as a whole and talk about the placement stability it offers. And finally, I hope it will present an opportunity for the government to look at support for fam families after child's adoption. And I welcome the fact that they're back backing our amendment this afternoon and the calls from the campaign from uh, Adoption UK and Scottish Adoption for a fair, de fair deal for adoptive families. I want to commend Adoption UK and Scotland's Adoption Register and the Scottish Government for putting together the document Reality of Adoption Scotland. It's not often that I get emotional 
preparing for debates. But I think the stories that were contained in that document are powerful and important. Because I think if we are to improve understanding of adoption, it's bringing out those uh, important stories that will improve that understanding. I was particularly struck by the stories of the two LGBT couples who have adopted since uh, 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 the Act of uh, 2007 allowed same-sex couples to adopt for the first time. They spoke of their apprehension as they went through the process, the pride of parenthood, and one couple saying it was the best thing they have ever done. So I was pleased to hear Mark MacDonald acknowledge the work of Hugh Henry and, and Robert Brown, who indeed it was the, the Labour coalition government that made these new families possible when it introduced the, their bill in 2006. However, there does seem to be some way to go in this regard. Compared to the situation in other parts of the UK, um, 1,690 adoptions to same-sex adopters have taken place in England compared to just 67 in, in Scotland um, in the last year. One, that means one in 12 adopters for the same sex uh, in England, one in 13 in Wales, compared to just one in 23 in Scotland. I would therefore be interested in the government's take on this trend and whether or not whether a cultural shift is needed to bring things in line or indeed whether new legislation or guidance is required. The message from this week should also certainly be to amplify um, th those voices but also bust the, the myths that surround ad adoption on age, on sexual orientation, on marital status, disability, income or on nationality. It does not matter. Adoption is open to all. Indeed, we heard from Monica Lennon and others about the stereotypes of the unwanted baby being taken in and rescued by usually affluent people. But we know that adoption can be an option for uh, looked after children of all ages. Adoption is open to couples and single people, affluent or not. And it is important that this week and in this debate we seek to dispel those myths uh, and not further them. Um, I think Jeremy Balfour did a very uh, good job of, of bringing to light the, the gap there is between the number of children seeking uh, uh, adoption and the placements made. I think it is worth noting that adoption is rare in comparison to the total number of looked after children in Scotland. We have 15,000 looked after children in this country and 4,000 uh, 4, children ceasing to be looked after each year with adoption uh, being the destination for just 7% of those young people. While, so while we very much welcome the increased attention that adoption gets this week, as a parliament, we must put adoption in context. It is not the usual final destination for children in care. Indeed, I also th would uh, thank Fulton McGregor for his comments this afternoon, because he, he shed some light on the experience of actually working with the system, the complexities and the judgments that have to take place in terms of balancing interests. But I think we must always seek to ensure that we, uh, the, the, the system and those processes are, carry are carried out as efficiently as possible. Another set of professional experiences we heard uh, from this afternoon was from Jenny Golruth. I think she did a, an excellent job of highlighting the long-term impacts, in particular educational impacts, experienced by many people um, uh, coming from care and being adopted. And indeed, I think it's permanence is a, an issue that has been highlighted by a, a number of people um, throughout this debate. I think Alison Johnson described that the, the, the childhood clock never stops t ticking. And indeed, the academic research into multiple placements for looked after children only serves to underline the importance that permanence plays. There's a large body of evidence that links multiple placements with problems with behaviour, mental health, educational difficulties, employment, social relationships, financial management and housing. Placement instability further reduces the opportunity for children to develop permanent secure attachments, leading uh, to transitory relationships can amount to a greater confusion and lack of social identity. So, of course, adoption isn't the only way to reduce uh, uh, placement instability. Long-term fostering, kinship care, as Bob Dorst pointed out, and residential care can all achieve that. But adoption is an important and transformative way to provide the permanence and reduce the, the number of placements. I think Ian Gray uh, did a, 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 an excellent job highlighting the importance that the ongoing support that is required to adoption. Indeed, other speakers highlighted those issues too. And it's important to recognise that need that is required for, of continued ongoing support for those adoptive families. I mean, Monica Lennon spoke on our amendment on the subject at the beginning of the, the debate. And as she said, a child who has come from a traumatic background and is adopted still needs support the, uh, the day after adoption. Adoption does mean permanence, but it doesn't mean that, that there should be added barriers uh, to support that, that put up. 
It is right, therefore, that priority support should be given to those adoptive families who need it, both in education and in mental health services. In conclusion, Scottish Labour are very happy to back the Government's motion today, marking the beginning of Adoption Week. And we hope that members will also consider backing our motion to recognise that families with adopted uh, children do face challenges and need support in education and mental health services. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr Johnson. I call Ross Thompson to wind up the Conservative Party. Up to 10 minutes, please. <coughs> Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I would like to start by declaring an interest uh, as Aberdeen City Councillor and therefore uh, as a corporate parent. And in starting, I would like to echo the comments of previous contributors who have welcomed this debate, the positivity in this debate and the unanimity of this debate as well. As the Scottish Government have rightly recognised, our system of care is in need of radical reform and the launch of a root and branch review which seeks to ensure that love is at the centre of that system, that every child in care is loved, feels loved, is very welcome. For far too long we have let the most vulnerable in our society down. As my colleague Maurice Corey highlighted in his remarks, more than one in ten young people leaving care in Scotland experience homelessness within two years. 14% of looked after school leavers receive no qualifications, while only 8% receive one or more qualification. Only 4% of care leavers go on to higher education. Although we have seen improvement in positive outcomes and destinations for care leavers since 2009, we have since 2012 seen the number of positive outcomes stagnate with very little improvement. These aren't somebody else's children, they are all of our children, which is why this Parliament, this Scottish Government, its agencies and our society needs to step up to ensure that our care leavers get the very best opportunities to succeed, to be what they want to be and to make the most of their potential. For those in care, we have work to do to ensure that children have a family, have love and most of all, have a childhood. If we're going to improve outcomes, then we must work to reduce the time it takes to find a permanent and stable placement. The evidence which we've seen at the Education and Skills Committee shows that in terms of educational attainment, those children in more permanent places with fewer moves achieve better. Therefore, it's important that greater weight is attached to permanent adoption, where this is in the best interest of the child to provide a permanent solution and a better outcome. Deputy Presiding Officer, to transform the system to deliver the best possible outcome for our children and young people will take work. The number of adoptions of children from care in Scotland has remained broadly flat in recent years. In fact, the most recent figures show that the proportion of children leaving care for adoption dropped from 7.2% to 6.9% between 2014 and 2015. Further, in 2012, the number of children who were living with prospective adopters was 1.6% of all children in care, yet two years later, in 2014, the number was 1.7%, so no real progress achieved, no real change achieved. As my colleague Liz Smith highlighted in her own contribution, it is astonishing that it takes, on average, over two years to secure an adoption, and we have had some extreme cases where it's taken up to 10 years. Therefore, a key objective of the Scottish Government should be to speed up this whole process to ensure that it is as simple as possible, whilst properly assessing compatibility to register as an adopter or foster family. Now, my colleague uh, Maurice Corey alluded in his own remarks uh, to the comments of Robin Duncan, the manager of Scotland's Adoption Register, when he warned that we still don't have enough adoptive families in Scotland for all the children needing placements. First of all, we need to congratulate the hard work that is being carried out by adoption agencies to recruit new adopters. And in order to help support this work and attract those new adopters, we on these benches believe that an adoption czar should be created. This would be a voluntary post appointed by Scottish ministers. Their task would be to coordinate and encourage the effort to raise the profile of adoption in Scotland so that we can make real progress in attracting the new adopters we need, as there are too many children still waiting for that loving family. 
Further, we still have work to do to change perceptions and attitudes, particularly to foster families, where too often it is viewed as for difficult children. In challenging these perceptions, we can work towards improving the supply of foster parents, which in turn helps to make placements last longer and therefore result in more positive outcomes. In turning to the contributions which have been made during this debate, my colleague Jeremy Balfour recognised and welcomed uh, the efforts of the Scottish Government and previous executives, and we welcome the extension of activity days. This is great news and, and welcome the comments that the Minister has made this afternoon. He made an important point about myth-busting around adoption and the need to encourage people to come forward for something which is, in his own words, hugely fulfilling, as well as highlighting the challenges in the system, because in the cases that he brought forward in relation to his own constituents, it can be complicated and it can be slow. My colleague uh, Liz Smith talked about the work of the Education and Skills Committee. I believe Tavish Scott referenced that too, and how they looked at the challenges round about educational attainment and what work could be done to help improve those outcomes for leavers from our care system. And we need to warmly congratulate the work of agencies who still continue to do all that they can to recruit new people uh, and to launch new campaigns and to urge the Minister again to look at all school leavers and the support that could be put in place uh, as they go out into the wider world. Uh, Monica Lennon in, in opening for Labour uh, touched on a very important point which was about the one in four families at risk of breaking down due to that lack of support. Uh, in fact, you, you used that quote of families hitting a brick wall. Uh, and I think that Tavis Scott um, articulately touched on that very point uh, when he spoke about the challenges of adoption breakdown and how it is upon us to try and understand the reasons and causes for this so that we can ensure that support is available uh, and that those families who do seek support in that natural and normal way do not feel stigmatised or ashamed for doing so. Uh, Jenny Galruth, well, um, I, I know you made the comment about people being tired of hearing your rhetoric as a teacher. I never do, and I always think that <laughs> it is a welcome uh, contribution to our uh, debates. Um, you touched on a really important point, which is how uh, we do deliver um, the best in, in attainment for uh, our young people and children, and then the best ways of supporting them in that educational environment and, it's just in, and in ensuring that that stable and secure home, that permanent uh, adoption placement, we can actually work towards securing that. Fulton McGregor actually uh, made a, a terrific contribution in speaking about his own direct experience in this area. Um, it was, it's incredibly valuable and talked about the importance of taking into account the views of the children and young people um, themselves and that they have to be at the heart of the decision-making process. Ian Gray talked about the vital role of being a corporate parent, uh, which needs to be taken very, very seriously, and that we cannot forget our role when it comes to a child who has uh, left our care. We always have that role um, as a corporate parent and that very real responsibility. And, but he touched on something else which wasn't mentioned elsewhere in the debate, which was actually the number of children who suffer from that prenatal substance and alcohol abuse. Um, so before a child is even born, um, a lot of their life chances are being decided for them. Um, and that has a huge and significant impact on their quality of life. I think that was a very important point to make. I really do welcome uh, Rona Mackay uh, and her um, own case where we have a wonderful story in a same-sex couple um, adopting for the first time. I think that's absolutely wonderful and we need to see uh, more of that because every, any home which is a loving one and a safe one uh, is something which we should be promoting and supporting. Alison Johnson and Gillian Martin both touched on the great success that there has been in Aberdeenshire uh, with the PACE programme where we've seen real improvements um, in that particular area and a real reduction in the decision making time as well coming in under 20 weeks. I think that lessons could be learned in other local authorities from what has happened um, in Aberdeenshire. Uh, Elaine Smith, uh, in her own remarks, touched on how we ensure that the views of children are actually taken into account as we go into this root and branch review. Um, and I look forward to hearing from the Minister as well how the Scottish Government intend to actually achieve that and to ensure that the voices of young people 
are heard. Uh, my colleague uh, Miles Briggs, um, in his own contributions, um, talked about how we can, as MSPs in our own regions and in our own constituencies, can work to encourage our own constituents to become involved, to become foster parents, to become adopters. And it was actually really interesting to learn about what's been happening in Edinburgh um, and what the City Council has taken forward in relation to their advertising campaign, um, as well as how we could potentially use social media more to inspire more people to come forward. So, Deputy uh, Presiding Officer, um, in making adoption easier, in reducing the barriers, we can attract more people to register so we can bring children and adopters together to secure loving environments where children and young people can reach their full potential, prosper, have a childhood, and most of all, feel loved. Thank you. So glad I gave you that extra minute. You squeezed <laughs> the juice right out of it. I uh, call uh, Mark Macdonald to wind up the debate for the Government Minister till 4.59, please. Uh, OK, uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. A number of members have spoken today about the consensual nature uh, of today's debate, and I think that's a, a fair point to make. However, there is still uh, rather a lot uh, from today's debate that I feel I need to respond to. Um, <clears throat> today's debate was framed uh, on adoption and permanence for a very important reason, because while much of the debate has rightly focused on adoption, with this being uh, Adoption Week, um, there are other routes to permanence that are available. Um, four uh, legal routes to permanence uh, are identified. Adoption, um, rehabilitated to return home, um, permanence order, which could result in a foster or residential placement, uh, and a kinship care order. And across the, the, pe the, the piece in this debate, I think we've heard a number uh, of speakers reflecting on those different routes to permanence. I think it's important uh, when we talk about uh, this debate that we recognise that all of those routes to permanence uh, will deliver uh, and can deliver substantially better outcomes for young people. So let's begin um, at the beginning. Um, Monica Lennon um, rightly spoke about the issue of uh, support for adoptive families. I think it, it would be uh, important to reflect that there is support available out there. Uh, I met with Adoption UK last month and I've agreed uh, the Scottish Government will work in conjunction with them uh, and with other stakeholders to review what therapeutic support is available uh, and crucially to ensure that that is clearly signposted. Uh, the Adoption uh, and Children Scotland Act 2007, which I referenced in my opening speech, uh, requires local authorities when requested uh, to include adopted children and those who have an adopted child to carry out an assessment of need for adoption support services, uh, where such assessment identifies a need for support services, local authorities are under a duty to provide them. Um, so following a, an assessment of need, some of the support available is information, advice, guidance and signposting, counselling, opportunities for adoptive parents to interact, mediation of contact with birth families, mediation services where an adoptive family is at risk of disruption, a point that has been highlighted by a number of speakers, financial support, uh, basic life story work and short break care where no therapeutic input is provided. So um, there are a number of support mechanisms that can be accessed. I think the question is whether or not these are readily identifiable uh, by adoptive families, and that's work that I've agreed with Adoption UK to look at in some more detail. Um, there was a number of points made regarding um, the disparity of numbers in terms of number of children seeking adoption and number of prospective adopters. Um, as of today, um, presiding officer, there are 140 children on the adoption register uh, and 132 prospective adopters. Now, clearly there is a disparity there, but it's not perhaps the gulf that might have been uh, suggested by some of the, the remarks in the debate today. Clearly, we want to ensure, however, that we do more to encourage more people to come forward as prospective uh, adopters. Um, I think uh, Je Jenny Gilruth uh, brought forward uh, important uh, examples linking the, the work of Curriculum for Excellence, the health and wellbeing aspects of that, uh, and also um, dispelling the myth about uh, adoption often being seen about being about babies, but often uh, these are uh, young and sometimes older children who require to be adopted. Turning to um, some of the uh, contributions from the Conservative benches, um, Liz Smith uh, highlighted the timescales uh, as a consequence of the, the SCRA report in 2011. Uh, what I would say is that um, obviously one of the, the sort of guiding uh, principles behind permanence and care excellence was to reduce those kind of uh, unacceptable delays within the system in terms of achievement of permanence. Um, I'm not 
uh, persuaded that an adoption SAR is what is needed. I think we have a lot of uh, very good work being done out there to highlight uh, and promote adoption. Um, but I'm, I'm, you know, if, if, if perhaps, perhaps it would be something to take up in a bit more detail, but I'm happy to take a brief intervention. Liz Smith. I thank the uh, Minister for giving way. I think just in relation to his previous comment about the need to um, publicise the facts about this, it could be a very helpful suggestion. Um, he's quite rightly pointed to some of the fact that, in some cases, it's not easy to publicise all the facts that we need to know, and that's one reason why I think it might be quite helpful. Minister. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to either receive more detail or perhaps discuss this further with Liz Smith at a later point uh, to understand exactly where uh, the Conservatives feel there would be benefit in terms of that approach. Um, Fulton McGregor, I think, brought very important uh, personal reflections from his past experience uh, as a social worker uh, and I think underlined the point that sometimes that delay which we uh, heard being spoken about is driven um, by the best of intentions to ensure that that child has every opportunity to remain within the family structure where that then eventually proves not to be uh, possible, uh, then permanence orders can sometimes uh, be required. But I think he quite rightly put some of that into perspective for us. Um, in terms of the Root and Branch Care Review, which uh, Fulton McGregor uh, mentioned and which Elaine Smith asked for more details on, um, we will be bringing more details uh, in relation to the Care Review to Parliament. Work is underway to ensure that we get this right in terms of the scope of the review, but also how we ensure that the review is taken forward in a way that is, dr that is driven by uh, the the views and experiences of uh, care experienced young people, which was a very firm commitment that the First Minister gave on launching the review. Uh, Ian Gray uh, touched on the issues around corporate parenting responsibilities and the fact that those do not simply uh, dematerialise when uh, children move into adopted placements. One of the things I've been quite keen to look at is how best we ensure uh, greater understanding and awareness of corporate parenting. So one of the things that I'm going to do is uh, in the new year, uh, at, at an early point, I'm going to set up a couple of sessions for MSPs to essentially discuss what corporate parenting is and how best we as MSPs can support uh, both uh, the work that corporate parents do in local authority areas but understand better our role uh, in terms of corporate parenting. I'm also keen to look at how following the local elections in May next year we can ensure that appropriate advice, support, training and guidance is given to newly elected and re-elected councillors regarding their corporate parenting responsibilities. I think uh, given the current climate we're operating in and the focus that there is uh, on looked after children's experiences now would seem a very opportune time for us to refresh some of the thinking in relation to that. Uh, Ian Gray also mentioned some of the uh, numbers in terms of the activity days that we have uh, seen and the mismatch perhaps between the number of families and the number of children. Um, these are obviously quite new approaches being taken and my hope and I hope every, everybody's hope on that uh, would be that as this embeds uh, we will see that uh, being addressed uh, as part of that. Uh, Rona Mackay uh, highlighted her own experience from the children's hearing system um, and uh, I decided uh, one of the things I wanted to do as a minister was to sit in uh, on a children's hearing um, and so I, I sat in on a couple of children's hearings in Aberdeen. Uh, I walked in and the, the gentleman chairing the children's hearing was my former school headmaster, um, which I don't think was the school reunion either of us had envisaged uh, previously. But one of the things that brought home to me um, was uh, one of the, the, the issues that was highlighted was that um, sometimes the decision making processes between children's hearings and the court system are not uh, as aligned as they should be, which results in interim decisions having to be taken in children's hearings and families often having to come back on repeated occasion to a hearing uh, before uh, a decision can be taken. And that obviously adds to some of the anxiety and trauma that can be created uh, as part of that. Can I ask you to speak to the microphone, Apo please? Thank apologies, you. Presiding Officer. Gillian uh, Martin uh, highlighted the um, excellent work being done by Aberdeenshire Council in relation to the PACE programme and the awards that they've won. Uh, I should just, uh, being a, a representative of the City of Aberdeen as well as the Minister, highlight that the award, uh, the Herald Society Award, was won in conjunction with Aberdeen City Council uh, in relation to their PACE uh, work combined. Um, and I have had the opportunity to meet officials from both local authorities to look at the work that they're doing there. Um, she also mentioned the uh, Young People's Campaigning Group uh, in Aberdeenshire who have taken the step of providing uh, guidance to uh, the Education Authority in relation to the kind of approaches that they think would work best for them. Uh, I think that's a very encouraging approach to be taking. Uh, it ensures that as 
essentially what we want to see through the care review of young people's experiences driving uh, the improvement uh, agenda that is being done uh, in Aberdeenshire. Um, I, 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 was, I, I thought Tavish Scott's uh, points were, were very important in terms of ensuring that we get the balance right in terms of what we're asking teachers to do, although I did find it interesting that at a meeting tomorrow at the Education Committee to discuss uh, teacher workload, they have quite a mountain of paperwork to get through on the Education Committee. I'm sure that will, the, the, the irony of that will not be lost on many. Um, Miles uh, Briggs, I think, made some very sensible suggestions around how best we can get the message out uh, about the benefits of becoming a prospective adopter. Um, I think that there are a number of uh, encouraging points that we can take forward in relation to that, and I'm happy to look into that further. Alison Johnson mentioned um, the possibility of a minimum fostering allowance um, and asked about financial support more generally in this area. Um, government uh, has committed to reviewing kinship and fostering allowances um, to create a national scheme. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that I've decided that within that I, should, I will also include adoption support as well. So details will follow, but I will be happy as part of that review to consult with opposition spokespeople and hear their views as part of that process. Um, just to touch on a couple of final points, presiding officer, before we come uh, to decision time. Um, on Bob Doris's point, he raised uh, the work being done by Kinship for the North and um, having recently completed a consultation on the future direction of our nationally commissioned support services for Kinship carers, I will be happy to meet uh, with Mr Doris and with Kinship for the North uh, in order to hear firsthand what their issues are and how best that could be captured uh, as we look to go out to tender uh, on those services. Um, and finally, uh, on Elaine Smith's point, um, Elaine Smith uh, said that what we needed to do in this was to have cognizance around local authority budget areas, particularly in relation to social work. Um, the Audit Scotland report on social work in Scotland identified that uh, since 2010-11 social work spending uh, across local authorities has increased by 3% in real terms. Uh, but beyond that, um, part of the work being done around permanence and care excellence is that by driving forward early permanence, you actually can potentially reduce some of the pressures that are faced by social workers from having caseloads uh, being uh, essentially exacerbated by cases which are difficult uh, to achieve permanence for. Um, presiding officer, this parliament has consistently put party politics aside on this agenda and I'm grateful that we've been able to do so again today. Um, I think the positive developments that I've outlined today uh, will go some way towards ensuring that more children benefit from a permanent caring home. Uh, I would urge members to think about how they could get the message across in their constituencies about the benefits uh, of adoption and also the benefits of achieving early permanence so that we can have more potential adopters coming forward and we can achieve better outcomes for all of Scotland's children. I thank the Minister. That concludes our debate on adoption and permanence. The next item of business is consideration of a business motion in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting a rise business programme. Uh, can Mr. Sorry, if any member wishes to speak against the motion, please press your request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motion. That's motion 2668. No member has asked to speak against the motion. I'll put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion 2668 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And there are just two questions as a result of today's business. The first question is that amendment 2624.1 in the name of Monica Lennon, who seeks to amend motion 2624 in the name of Mark MacDonald on adoption and permanence in Scotland, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The final question is that motion 2624, in the name of Mark MacDonald, as amended, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. That concludes the decision time. We'll now move to members' business, and we'll take a few moments just to change seats. <laughs>